Good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning. Can I open the meeting today and welcome everyone to the 13th meeting of the Social Security Committee for 2017. Can I remind everyone to turn their mobile phones off as it does interfere with the recording equipment. Uh, apologies have been received from Mark Griffin and Richard Lennon is in attendance at the committee in substitution for Mark. Agenda item one is Child Poverty Scotland Bill, and we only have that on the agenda today, which is consideration of the Child Poverty Bill at Stage 2. I would like to highlight to the committee that if we finish Stage 2 proceedings today, we will not need to meet on Monday next week to receive our briefing on the Social Security Bill and consider our approach. We could use our usual Thursday morning slot for that meeting. Hopefully, this will be an incentive for today. Uh, I would like to welcome the Cabinet Secretary and the company officers to the meeting. Welcome and good morning. And we will now start proceedings of Stage 2 of the Bill. Can I first of all call Amendments 9 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with Amendments 10, 12, 12A, 13, 23, 24, 25, 28 and 29. And Cabinet Secretary, I call you to move Amendment Two, sorry, Amendment Nine, and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, good morning, convener, and uh, to committee colleagues. Um, I'll now speak to my own amendments in this group, as requested, and respond to the amendments in the name of Polly McNeill and Adam Tompkins. There has been a, a growing body of support for the introduction of interim targets. Uh, we have heard during the committee evidence sessions many stakeholders speak to the importance of interim targets to instil a sense of urgency and to drive action to meet the 2030 targets. And I agree with uh, many of the arguments put forward. Amendment 12 therefore places a duty on Scottish Ministers to meet uh, a set of interim targets in the financial year 2023-24, uh, the midway point between now and the 2030 target year. The interim targets will be based on the same four measures as the 2030 targets, relative poverty, absolute poverty, uh, combined low income and material deprivation and persistent poverty. Amendment 12 proposes that the interim target levels are set in regulations and there are two justifications uh, for this. Uh, firstly, the interim targets should be based on all available evidence and we will be producing baseline projections for the first delivery plan, which will give us a, a robust basis on which to set realistic uh, but sufficiently stretching interim targets. As I made clear during the stage one debate, it is my firm view that we must be led by the evidence in our work to tackle child poverty. Given that we know uh, child poverty is projected to rise across the UK, largely as a result of uh, welfare reform, and we need to consider carefully uh, what the impact of that will be and how it will affect the work that we take forward. I believe that setting arbitrary interim target levels on the face of the bill before that detailed and important work has been done would be unwise. Secondly, convener, we intend to seek advice from our Independent Poverty and Inequality Commission, which we will come to discuss uh, obviously later on this morning, uh, and we'll discuss with the Poverty and Inequality Commission on what appropriate uh, in those interim targets should be. Amendment 23 arises as a result of Amendment 12. Uh, Section 9 of the Bill requires that the final annual progress report to set out whether the 2030 targets have been met and if not, why not. Uh, similar provisions will be required in relation uh, to the annual report uh, covering the interim uh, target year. The progress report for financial year 2024-25 will refer to the 2023-24 interim target year statistics. Amendment 23 requires that, that report to include details of whether each of the interim targets have been met and in event that they have not been met to explain why this is the case. Amendments 9, 10, 24, 25, 28 and 29 are minor technical amendments which arise as a result of the fact that there are now two sets of targets and it's necessary to be clear uh, which set is being referred to throughout the Bill. In particular, Amendments 20 and 29 establish the difference between interim targets, uh, 2030 targets and child poverty targets, which is uh, to be the term applied to both sets of targets where both sets are relevant for reporting purposes. 
Convener, uh, my proposals on interim targets and interim reporting are thorough and robust. Uh, they will allow us to develop evidence-based interim target levels and they increase the opportunities for parliamentary scrutiny of Scottish Minister's progress by requiring us to give a detailed interim report. They take into account evidence that we heard during the committee evidence sessions. As Jim McCormick of the Joseph Rowntree Foundation said, there is a strong case to have a thorough root and branch look at whether we are making substantial progress at pace towards achieving the targets by 2030. I now turn to Amendment 12A in the name of uh, Polly McNeill. Uh, while I very much understand the rationale behind Ms McNeill's proposed targets, which appear to be the halfway point between the latest published statistics and the 2030 target level, uh, I would argue that my proposal for the interim targets to be based on evidence and considered by Parliament when I bring forward regulations is a more robust approach. The same arguments apply to Amendment 13 in the name of Adam Tomkins, and I would be interested to hear how Mr Tomkins arrived at the levels he is proposing, which seem to me to be um, arbitrary and uh, take no account of the likely uh, impacts of external factors, uh, such as the uh, ongoing programme of austerity. It is also not clear to me why Amendment 13 requests the Scottish Government to estimate the number of children living in persistent poverty in 2014-15 in order to then establish an appropriate interim target level. Uh, the Scottish Government has already published uh, persistent poverty rates for 2011 to 2015 for Scotland, and the current level is 12%. Uh, much of Amendment 13, therefore, uh, in my opinion, appears to be uh, unnecessary. I do wish to be clear uh, on one point, though. Although I propose that the interim targets uh, be set in regulations, I absolutely accept that Parliament should have the opportunity to scrutinise the level of the interim targets, and that's why I'm proposing that the regulations uh, that I will bring forward will be subject to affirmative procedure. Uh, and I can also confirm today, convener, that my intention would be to bring those regulations forward in sufficient time that the interim target levels would be set in statute in time for the publication uh, of the first delivery plan in April 2018. So, convener, for the reasons I have set out. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot support Amendments 12V and 13. I move Amendment 9 and ask uh, members to support my other amendments uh, in the group. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Polly McNeill to speak to Amendment 12V and other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Um, uh, first of all, can I welcome what the Cabinet Secretary has said uh, up till now on the need to have interim targets. So that's very much welcome. Um, this uh, is an amendment which was um, drafted by the Law Society, and when I saw it, I thought it could make perfect sense. I was in favour of having targets set, uh, interim targets set on the face uh, of the bill, and they seem to be a kind of halfway um, between 2030 and on the specific targets on relative poverty, absolute poverty, and persistent poverty. Um, I mean, that was certainly my concern that um, if it's not on the face of the bill, I'm, I'm pleased that you've said that that is an affirmative uh, procedure. Um, uh, however, I do feel strongly that it should be on the face of the bill, and I think the Parliament should have a full say in it. I mean, it's a very short period of time, as we know. I mean, they are ambitious targets, and that has to be um, commended. Um, so I think it is really important that we are clear about what the targets that are the interim targets before 2030 um, are. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Adam Tomkins to speak to Amendment 13 and other amendments in the group. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, uh, I, I, like Pauline McNeill, I support um, the uh, government's recognition um, that interim targets are needed. Um, like Pauline McNeill, I think very strongly that the interim targets should be on the face of the bill. I don't think it's um, fair to describe the interim targets as arbitrary, unless we also think that the 2030 targets are arbitrary. There's nothing, there's no, there's nothing more, any more arbitrary about the 2024 targets than the 2030 targets. So I don't think that's a, a helpful uh, way to um, uh, proceed. All witnesses who gave oral evidence on this 
uh, to the committee in its stage one uh, inquiry um, thought that the bill, who expressed a view about the matter, said that the bill should include interim targets and that these should be on the face of the bill, uh, not um, agreed subsequently by delegated legislation. And that is what the committee <coughs> unanimously said in its recommendation uh, um, at paragraph 65 of its stage one report, which, which says that the committee is of the view that interim targets should be on the face of the bill. And unfortunately, the Cabinet Secretary's amendment doesn't um, deliver on that. Um, uh, but Pauline McNeill's amendment, uh, 12A, to the Cabinet Secretary's amendment does. So we'll be supporting uh, Pauline McNeill's uh, amendment, uh, 12A. And if that is agreed, I will we'll withdraw my amendment um, 13. Um, my amendment 13 uh, seeks to um, uh, create a series of uh, um, interim targets which are not arbitrary but which are calculated at halfway by half time. So there's a 12-year period that we're talking about here between the enactment of this uh, bill uh, and 2013, 2030. Um, the halfway point is 2024 uh, and the interim targets are calculated um, by um, uh, looking at where uh, we sit now with regard to these targets as recorded in the government's own most recent um, annual report on the um, child poverty strategy in Scotland um, uh, and uh, looking at that uh, marker and looking at the 2030 target in section one of the bill and saying we should be halfway to achieving those 2030 targets by, by half time. Um, the reason why uh, there is no figure given uh, for the fourth um, uh, um, statutory target on persistent poverty is because there is no figure given in the annual report on child poverty for 2014, which is the most recent one, sorry, 2016, which is the most recent one. Um, uh, and so we were giving, I was proposing to give the government some discretion in terms of calculating what that, what that is. But if the cabinet secretary already knows the figure, then, then that could be, then that could be a, a, adjusted at stage three. But as I say, if amendment 12A in the name of Pauline McNeill, which we will support is accepted uh, today, then I will not press amendment 13. But I, I do very strongly think um, and indeed the committee unanimously only a few weeks ago very strongly thought that interim targets should be on the face of the bill and Amendment 12A delivers that. Amendment 12 does not. <coughs> Cabinet Secretary, you wish to wind up? Very much, uh, convener. I think it is important to emphasise that uh, under uh, my proposals, uh, Parliament will indeed uh, have a full say in setting interim targets, uh, because interim targets will be set out in regulations, uh, and Parliament, of course, has to uh, approve those uh, regulations. I hope, uh, given the tone and tenor of my opening remarks, that I've um, demonstrated that the government has certainly listened uh, to committee and to others. Um, but to summarise uh, my position, uh, convener, I do believe that interim targets should be informed uh, by the evidence I've outlined the work that we need to do in terms of uh, baseline uh, projections. And it would also be my intention uh, to have the support and advice uh, from the, the Poverty and uh, Inequality uh, Commission as well. And uh, that the government has also demonstrated uh, enhanced opportunities uh, for scrutiny, given that uh, we uh, will have an enhanced uh, progress uh, report that's very clearly seen um, you know, if um, targets have been met and if they've not been met, uh, why not? And of course, we're all familiar uh, with the uh, affirmative uh, procedure and I repeat my commitment uh, to have the work done and to have the regulations um, taken through Parliament, if it's Parliament's will, in time for the very first delivery plan. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we now go to the vote. The question is that Amendment 9 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. Uh, call Amendment 10 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated with Amendment 9. Cabinet Secretary, you move formally, please. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 10 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, call Amendment 3 in the name of Adam Tompkins, grouped with Amendment 4. Adam Tompkins to move Amendment 3 and speak to both amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Um, I move Amendment 3 and um, uh, speak to the amendments in, in, in the group. <coughs> so we all know that the uh, Section 1 of the Bill um, uh, contains four income-related uh, targets, um, uh, measurements of child poverty which are focused on income. Um, uh, we also uh, all know that um, poverty is much more complex than that. Um, this is underscored by the government's own comprehensive and holistic approach to child poverty in its child poverty 
uh, measurement framework, which has 37 indicators of poverty contained within it, most of which do not relate to income. Um, uh, then the approach that uh, we want to take uh, to this bill is not to reduce or dilute the income targets at all, but to supplement those income targets with two further sets of targets, targets concerned with uh, children growing up in workless families and or households, uh, and uh, targets concerned with the education um, under attainment gap. So our approach is not that we should take an either-or um, view of poverty. It's not, we're not saying that you should look only at income or that you should look only at um, uh, education and worklessness, but we should look at all of these uh, issues uh, in, in the round. Um, and so uh, the amendments in this group are amendments which seek to add to the bill um, uh, a target um, uh, uh, concerning the number of children growing up in Scotland in uh, workless uh, households. Um, and the way in which we have um, uh, tried to um, identify and define what we mean by that is drawn directly from the government's own, the Scottish government's own um, child poverty measurement framework. Um, the child poverty strategy for Scotland already recognises the importance of par parents' employment rate. So does United Kingdom law in the Life Chances Act, and our view is that this child poverty bill should also uh, recognise the importance of this in statute. The target is calculated with reference to the parental employment rate in Scotland between 2007 and 2014, as recorded in the government's most recent annual report on child poverty in Scotland, which has moved up from 80.4% in 2007 to 81.8% in 2014. And the target that we're proposing is that that should rise to 86% by 2030, which is a 4% increase on the 2014 figure. We think that that is ambitious um, but, and stretching. Um, but realistic um, and is therefore commensurate with the ambitious but stretching and ho hopefully realistic targets which the Cabinet Secretary has already set um, in uh, Section 1 of the Bill as introduced. McPherson, do you want to come in? Thank, thank you, Convener. Um, th thank you, Adam Tompkins, for it, it going through and explaining your, your amendments as proposed. I have, have some misgivings about the, the logic and the principle uh, to bring them forward within this legislation and the principle of the, particularly the, the notions and, and the language used. I think we all share an ambition across this parliament to increase employment and to, to help those who, who can and uh, need to go into employment to, to access those labour markets. However, the way that the art amendments are articulated and the notions behind them in my view, it seemed to shift the, the cause of poverty onto people and the utilisation of the concept of worklessness within the, the, def, uh, within the amendments as drafted uh, is language that I don't think uh, helps the, 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 the principles of addressing poverty and is, is language that uh, um, does not belong in the, in the 21st century as we try to address these issues. And on a logical basis, I uh, do not, I'm not clear what definition uh, workless households uh, encapsulates within this uh, uh, set of amendments. And for those reasons, I will not be supporting these amendments. Ms. McGuire. Yeah. Um, share um, my colleague's concern about this. I think the term worklessness is part of a rhetoric which shifts the blame of poverty onto individuals rather than recognising the structural aspects of it. Um, it's measuring employment as well and not income, which is what this bill um, is about. And that's, income is what's need to be measured because you can be in work and be in poverty still. We've got low, you could have um, low pay, poor hours. Um, Worklessness also doesn't take into account um, that there will be people who are who are not employed, who are have caring responsibilities, um, who are um, studying. I just I, I really object to this amendment and the term. Any other member, Alison Johnson? Sorry. Yeah, I'd just like to add, convener, that I don't think worklessness is a reliable indicator of poverty. Um, while workless households are more likely to be in poverty. The working households, 70% of poor children are in households with at least one working parent. Um, some families can be in poverty with two working adults. 
Um, I think this bill does define poverty in terms of income, and I'm not convinced that the that the, the, the should be included. Thank you, George Adam. Would you? Yeah, I would just like to say I agree with my colleagues on this one. I, the term worklessness is not the kind of term we want to be using. Ben is 100% right when he says in this the 21st century we shouldn't be using this term because when you look at it, it almost makes it out as if it's individuals. It's their problem. It's them that's created that. And as we've already said, there may be various reasons why people are in these positions, whether it be a carer looking after a disabled member of their family, whether it be someone that's actually kind of given up to support other members of their family as well. You know, I, I find the term is uh, just not what we're looking at. And I believe that we've actually got the, uh, the actual targets and the data there that we need. And I just think this is probably not where we should be going with this, Camino. Paula, you wanted to come in? I just wanted to add very briefly, I mean, I agree what, with what um, others have said up until now. Um, I'll not be supporting this amendment, but um, one, of the, one of the reasons uh, I won't be supporting it is because I think that what the committee has heard over the last few months is that two-thirds of people who, are in who live in poverty are in work. So being in work is not necessarily a pathway out to poverty, and I think it would give the wrong signal if we were to put this in the bill. Uh, thank you very much. Can, can I just uh, say to Adam Tompkins, thank you very much for, for the stats you gave us. But the word worklessness, uh, the definition of worklessness can be somebody who's disabled. It can be a full-time student at university. So they're not workless. Uh, some are actually doing studying, and it can also be early retirees as well. So certainly I'm not minded to support this amendment either, simply because of the word worklessness households, I think, is, is demeaning. Uh, we're looking at a Social Security bill, which is based on dignity and respect. I think anything that says worklessness or workless uh, is more demeaning to the people than anything else. So uh, I've had my say along with the other members of the committee, uh, basically. Uh, Adam, Cabinet Secretary, sorry. Oh, thank you, uh, Kavina. Um, Kavina, with this bill, the, the Scottish Government is making a, a clear statement that uh, income or uh, lack of income is central to poverty, which is a view that uh, our stakeholders strongly share, and it is why the, the four targets are set at the heart of the bill um, and the focus on a range of aspects that are uh, to do with low income. Um, it won't be a surprise uh, to Mr Tonkins. I mean, I am opposed to amendments uh, three and four, uh, as these amendments in themselves uh, will do nothing to increase the income of families of children uh, living in poverty. Uh, the new target which Amendments 3 and 4 seeks to introduce uh, does not relate to income. In fact, it relates only to persons in employment. And as we know, employment uh, in itself is not necessarily uh, a route out of uh, poverty. And as uh, Ms Johnston and others this morning have, have outlined, uh, in 2015-16, 70 per cent of children in poverty uh, were living in households with at least one adult uh, in employment. Uh, and that's a 15 per cent increase from 2010-11. So while rates of employment in Scotland are relatively high, changes to the quality and nature of work uh, alongside uh, welfare reforms uh, from Westminster, as we have seen, have driven up uh, in-work poverty. So the four measures outlined uh, within the bill convener are well known uh, and they're well understood uh, amongst the stakeholders and retaining them would provide a degree of uh, continuity and these measures uh, were chosen following uh, extensive consultation and are designed to complement each other with each capturing uh, different aspects of poverty. Uh, they are also strongly supported in Scotland and across the UK. Analysis of responses to a Department of Work and Pensions consultation on the targets in 2012 concluded there is a very strong support for the existing measures and near universal support for keeping income poverty and material deprivation at the heart of poverty measurement. And as outlined by Jim McCormick of the Joseph Rentree Foundation during the first uh, committee evidence session, where he said it is important that we have a small core set of the right targets that are informed by uh, a richer measurement uh, or monitoring framework 
that gets more into the detail uh, of the connections that drive the outcomes uh, around those targets and I've no doubt we'll probably later on this morning talk in more detail uh, around uh, our existing measure measurement framework and how we can improve that which to ensure that it captures uh, all the correct uh, causes and consequences uh, of poverty. So convener, uh, th these are my reasons why uh, we've selected these four core uh, measurements uh, and for the reasons I've set out, I don't support amendments uh, three and four. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Um, Adam Tompkins to wind up and um, press a withdrawal. Yeah, very briefly, um, Kavina, um, and th thank, you, th thank you all committee members and the Cabinet Secretary for their remarks about these um, uh, amen amendments. Um, uh, they, are, they are, I suppose, based on the insight um, uh, from the Joseph Rantry Foundation in its report on how we can solve UK poverty in September 2016, in which the Joseph Rantry Foundation said, and I quote, for those who can, work represents the best route out of poverty, unquote. Um, uh, and, you know, our very, our very strong sense is that no anti-poverty strategy is going to be effective unless it includes, I'm not saying it has to be uniquely focused on, uh, but unless it includes uh, um, uh, a focus on uh, employment, employment rates, employability. The, the word workless is used simply to capture both employment and self-employment. Um, it's not meant to connote any negative um, uh, uh, or uh, 19th century uh, connotations at all. It's just a, 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 a widely used um, uh, uh, word that um, includes both employment and self-employment. Um, uh, the, the amendments um, uh, uh, do not seek to blame anybody uh, for being in poverty, quite the opposite. Um, the, there, is, there is nothing in uh, these amendments and there is nothing in my remarks about these amendments earlier on this morning to suggest that I think that um, uh, poverty is caused by worklessness, but there is clearly a correlation between poverty and worklessness, or if you prefer, between poverty and unemployment. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't have in the Scottish Government's own child poverty measurement framework indicators of child poverty that are to do with per the per parental employment. So um, uh, we do take the view that there is a correlation between uh, unemployment uh, and poverty, and we do take the view that no effective child poverty strategy is going to work unless it includes a focus uh, on uh, employment. And so for those reasons, I will press these amendments. Thank you very much, Mr. Thompson. The question is that amendment three be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. no. So we aren't agreed, so there will be a vote. Uh, the question is that uh, amendment three be agreed. We vote. Uh, those in favour, sorry, raise your hand. Sorry, I should have explained that. Okay. Uh, those against, raise your hands. Got to allow a couple of minutes to get the vote counted. Thank you very much. It's not minutes, just seconds. <laughs> Se sorry, <laughs> seconds, I was told. Uh, total votes for two, uh, total votes against one. Uh, no abstention. Uh, the amendment is disagreed to. Thank you very much. Again, seven. Seven, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, call amendment 11 in the name of Adam Tompkins and the group on its own. Adam Tompkins to move and speak to amendment 11. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, so th th this um, amendment, in a, in, a, in, in a sense, is a companion to the amendment um, that we've just um, debated and voted on. Um, again, it underscores uh, our approach uh, to child poverty, which is that um, too narrow a focus on income alone isn't going to work, uh, and that a, a number of um, what you might call life chances indicators need to be added uh, to the bill, not in order to dilute the focus um, or distort the focus on income, but simply to add to that. Again, um, this is c c perfectly consistent with the approach that the Scottish Government already takes to its child poverty measurement framework, which includes quite a number of indicators, which quite rightly includes uh, a number of indicators um, uh, pertaining to educational uh, attainment. Um, the Child Poverty Strategy for Scotland recognises educational under as an indicator of child poverty. Indeed, it states, and I quote, that education plays a key role in contributing to the future prospects of Scotland's children. Now, the um, Education Scotland Act 2016 
already provides that ministers must have regard to the link between socio-economic disadvantage and educational underattainment in the exercise of their powers relating to school education. This, I think, is important and welcome, um, but is not uh, going far enough, because the statistics produced by the Scottish Government themselves show that educational underattainment is an increasing problem uh, in um, Scottish school education, not a not a decreasing problem. So my Amendment 11 is designed to add to and um, uh, uh, give even more backbone to the must-have regard duty that we already have uh, in the Education uh, Scotland Act. My proposed target in Amendment 11 <coughs> is derived directly from the Child Poverty <coughs> Strategy in Scotland, which measures the performance of P7 pupils from the 30% most deprived SIMD data zones, including in numeracy <coughs> and writing. That's the measure that I've, as it were, copied and pasted um, in Amendment 11, with the target set at 80%. Current performance is 54.3% in numeracy and 56% in writing. These are shocking statistics that we should all be concerned with. And it, it seems to me that no child poverty bill that this Parliament passes is likely to be successful in its aspirations, aspirations which we all share right across the uh, chamber and across the committee, unless it is prepared to confront and tackle the problem of educational uh, underattainment uh, in the way that Amendment 11 seeks to address. I move. Thank you. Ben McPherson, do you want to come in? Not particularly at this stage. Oh, sorry, I thought you'd nodded. No, I, 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 I don't mean you to come in. I just yeah. thought you had nodded. Uh, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, uh, Convener. Um, as we've just heard, uh, Amendment 11 uh, attempts to establish uh, a new target for uh, educational attainment uh, based on two of the indicators from our child poverty uh, measurement framework. Um, for the reasons I set out in the debate on the, the previous groupings, uh, I am opposed to an additional target on educational attainment. And I reiterate you know, my, my firm belief that the focus on income is cru crucial and correct. It is an approach that is uh, welcomed uh, by stakeholders, and I think we would be unwise to depart from what is generally considered by those who are experts uh, in the matter as a, an appropriate and robust set of poverty uh, measures. Um, of course, Mr Tompkins uh, is aware a renowned child poverty measurement framework uh, does consider a wide range of factors that impact uh, on the lives of children and their families, including uh, educational attainment and underemployment. And these matters and a range of other matters uh, are the causes and consequences uh, of child poverty. Uh, they do indeed uh, have to be conf confronted, they will have to be measured in the, the measurement framework and they have to be addressed uh, in the uh, delivery plan. And I accept that it is uh, absolutely important to look at the, at the broader picture and that is why uh, I have uh, made that commitment to review the measurement framework in time for inclusion uh, for the, the very first delivery plan. So um, I would very much welcome views from Mr Tompkins and indeed uh, any other committee members on the review uh, of the measurement framework, but my strong view remains that the central focus uh, of the bill and the targets uh, must uh, be on, on income. Adam Tompkins, you want to wind up and I don't think there's very much I can, I can usefully uh, add, convener. I don't agree um, with the Cabinet Secretary, I'm afraid. Um, I agree with her about much of this bill, but I don't agree with her that an effective child poverty strategy that focuses only on income is going to work. And what I'm trying to do is to add some further teeth to that strategy and add some further teeth to that bill so that we can all stand a better chance of realising our collective ambition to eradicate child poverty in Scotland. I just don't understand the argument that you can do this by focusing on income alone and not also having uh, tough statutory targets to close the attainment gap. The First Minister of Scotland has said uh, that education is her number one, her government's number one priority. This amendment um, gives us the opportunity to give some legislative uh, teeth to that political aspiration. Um, uh, education should be the uh, top priority of everybody in the Scottish Parliament, not just everybody in the Scottish Government. And here's an opportunity actually to do something about it. So I move. I, press, I would like to press the amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Tompkins. Um, the question is: that uh, Amendment 11 be agreed to? No. 
We are not agreed, and, and there will be a vote. So the question is that Amendment 11 be agreed. Sure, please, please show your hands those in favour of the amendment. OK, that's fine, thank you. Those against the amendment, please raise your hands. A couple of moments for the hands, I think that's fine. Yep, thank you very much. Okay, the results of votes are total votes for two, total votes against seven, no abstentions. The amendment is disagreed. <coughs> Thank you very much. And the question is that section one be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Yes. Uh, call amendment 12 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, which has already been debated with amendment nine. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Uh, move. Call Amendment 12A in the name of Pauline McNeill, already debated with Amendment 9. Pauline McNeill to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 12A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. We're not agreed in Amendment 12A and there will be a vote. Those in favour, please raise your hands. Those against, please raise your hands. And the results are total votes for five, total votes against four, no abstentions. The amendment 12A is agreed to. Thank you. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, do you wish to press or withdraw amendment 12? Um, with, withdraw. Press. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's just it's already been moved, so that's unfortunately... I'll have to press then with, it's already withdraw. moved. <laughs> so you wish to press amendment 12? I'll press amendment 12. Okay, thank you. Those in favour of Amendment 12, well, are we agreed with Amendment 12? No. Because they're mutually exclusive. I'm confused about what we're voting on now. We've just agreed 12A, which is an amendment to 12. Yes. So you need to... We're now voting on 12 as amended. 12 as amended? Yes. I have. 12 as amended? Yes. I, I agree. I agree. I agree with 12 as amended. Yeah. OK. We're agreed. Put the question again, just for the audience of any doubt. I've been advised to put the question again in for avoidance of any doubt. Uh, the amendment at the moment is in Cabinet Secretary's name, Amendment 12, which has been amended by 12A. Are we all agreed in that amendment? Yes. yes. OK. Thank you. I am to call Amendment 13, in the name of Adam Tompkins, already debated with Amendment 9. Adam Tompkins to move or not move? Uh, not move. OK. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the, set, the question is that section two be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you very much. Call amendment 14, in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and a group of his own. Cabinet Secretary to move and speak to amendment 14. OK, thank you, Convener. Amendment 14 changes from negative to affirmative. The procedure attached uh, to the regulations Scottish Ministers may bring forward uh, under Section 3. Uh, this amendment will ensure that any regulations specifying a change to the base year for calculation of the absolute poverty target should be subject to the enhanced parliamentary scrutiny uh, afforded by the affirmative procedure. Uh, this amendment responds directly to the recommendations of this committee and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. And I move Amendment 14. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. The question is that Amendment 14 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. The question is that Section 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that Section 4 and 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. I call Amendment 35 in the name of Polly McNeill, grouped with Amendment 36. Polly McNeill to move Amendment 35 and speak to both amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, these are probing amendments. Um, I thought in view of the evidence that the committee heard, uh, first of all, in relation to um, people with disabilities or long-term illness, and the evidence that we heard about the additional costs of being disabled, I thought I was quite struck by that evidence. And I think it's something that the, the bill and the work of the government should address in the long run. 
I thought there was a certain logic, therefore, to just simply d debate and look at the question of whether or not we're calculating the net household income of uh, those with <coughs> someone in the household with a disability um, might be something that should be considered when we're looking at, at who is living in poverty. Um, as I say, as a probing amendment, I really wanted to hear uh, what the Cabinet Secretary had to say about the issue. And similarly, for, for similar reasons on Amendment 36, I was also struck by the evidence given to the committee um, of, of lone parents, and not just the question of uh, living in low income, but the, the difficulties arising um, for those families with only uh, one, one, one parent. Um, one of the reasons I'm going to move a later amendment in relation to the automation of benefits was, was around my, what I'd heard um, in Glasgow City Council around um, the automation of benefits, which helped a lot of single parents because one of the issues about their their lives is that somebody just don't have time to fill in forms and so on. However, um, in relation to the, these amendments, convener, um, I simply want to have to hear what the cabinet secretary has to say on those points. Thank you. Cabinet secretary. Thank you. Uh, Kavina, stakeholders uh, who work consistently on poverty issues have uh, made it clear uh, in both their consultation responses and their evidence at stage one that the targets that we have proposed are robust, widely understood, comprehensive and complementary and they allow for comparisons at UK level and allow us to track progress over time. And the targets are based on definitions of net household income and have been developed over decades with substantial input uh, from independent, internationally renowned experts, including senior academics from Scotland. I do, have a, however, uh, understand very much why uh, Polly McNeill wishes to amend the bill to make reference to uh, the additional costs that disabled people and lone parents uh, have, have to bear. And I agree with Ms McNeill that these are uh, vitally important issues. And I hope to uh, reassure her and committee that the existing measures in the bill do already go uh, some way to address them. The material deprivation measure, for example, provides some indirect evidence as paying additional costs will leave individuals with less money to buy uh, the basic essentials that are included uh, in our material deprivation uh, measure. What's more, the, the calculation of household income is already equivalised. That is, it's adjusted to take account of household composition. In short, the fact that a lone parent household costs more per adult than a two-person household is already taken account of in the measures uh, in the bill. Uh, making a material change in how net household incomes are calculated as implied uh, by these amendments uh, would, in my view, be a, a substantial and, frankly, uh, a risky task. And my statisticians have advised me that there is no accepted methodology for assessing such costs. They have assured me that developing any new methodology would need substantial time and, and resources. And data on household income is collected on a UK basis, and data collection on a differential basis for Scotland is likely to be costly and difficult. So I am concerned that, the, that problems may arise in agreeing such a methodology uh, that would be difficult to resolve. Um, in short, uh, convener, these amendments have the potential to cause serious difficulties for implementing the bill. Even if the methodology were agreed uh, and data collection issues resolved, in several years' time we would end up with a methodology for calculating uh, net household income that was untested in practice uh, and different from UK definitions, meaning comparisons across the UK uh, were no longer viable. Uh, and comparisons with the, the recent past would also uh, no longer uh, be possible. Now, I know that Polly McNeill and other committee members want to see us move quickly to take strong action on child poverty and I couldn't agree more uh, with that sentiment and I'm sure I do not want civil servants to spend uh, the next year focused on redefining uh, net household income when already we have internationally renowned methodology in place uh, that does already consider issues of costs and household composition. 
Uh, statistics on uh, loan payment poverty and disability poverty are already published uh, on an annual basis, uh, but nonetheless I have asked my statisticians to consider uh, how we can make sure that the stats we produce uh, are as useful as they can be uh, going forward to inform our understanding of loan payment and disability poverty uh, and obviously that debate about additional costs. And I would be very happy, convener, to write to the committee uh, setting out uh, this in more detail. Uh, however, convener, for the reasons that I've uh, set out at length uh, above, uh, I cannot uh, support amendments uh, 35 and 36. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Pauline McNear to wind up and press a withdrawal. Um, I, I'm not going to press these amendments. Um, I, I, I welcome the very comprehensive answer that you've given the committee. And I do think that it would be useful if um, there could be a, a better breakdown of statistics showing um, the impact of poverty on lone parents and people with disabilities. I really think that would be really helpful on that basis. Convener, I'm, I'm not going to press those amendments. So you're going to withdraw amendments 35 and 36? Yep, I am. Is that agreeable by the committee that um, yes. was run? Thank you very much. Uh, the question now is that section 6 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Call amendment 4 in the name of Adam Tompkins. Already debated with amendment 3. Adam Tompkins to move or not move? I'll move. Thank you very much, Mr Tompkins. Call amendments 15 in the name of Adam Tompkins. Group with amendments 15A, 30, 20 and 47. Adam Tompkins, move amendment 15 and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, uh, th thank you. Uh, convener, I move Amendment 15 uh, in my name, which um, uh, seeks to establish a poverty and inequality commission in statute. Um, independent scrutiny um, uh, of the government's um, delivery plans and progress reports um, with regard to child poverty will be essential if we are to su succeed in our collective ambition to realise the aspirations and achieve the targets set uh, by this bill. That scrutiny needs to be robust, um, and it will, of course, come from multiple sources, the Parliament itself, the third sector, um, and, I hope, an effective statutory commission. Um, but it's not just me who hopes this convener, it's the whole of the committee. Uh, we were agreed um, unanimously in our Stage 1 report um, that, uh, as the bill currently stands, there's a concern that the potential for the scrutiny arrangements around tackling child poverty will be weaker than those previously in place at UK level. And I quote directly from paragraph 122 of our report, therefore the committee believes that the establishment of a commission on a statutory footing with a duty to scrutinise the Scottish Minister's delivery and progress plans is required, unquote. And my amendments 15, 30 and 20 in this group uh, seek to give effect um, to that unanimous recommendation of this uh, committee uh, in its stage one report a few weeks ago. My amendments seek to do that as simply and as straightforwardly as possible. Um, uh, in this way, Amendment 15 creates the Commission. Uh, amendment 30 is a schedule um, that makes uh, detailed provision for a small Commission. Um, uh, it uh, includes provisions uh, on the Commission's size, um, appointments, uh, period of appointment um, and remuneration. Um, and I have deliberately tried to construct the committee, the commission, so that it falls within and doesn't violate um, the uh, uh, fact that um, there is no financial resolution for this bill. Um, and the presiding officer has, as I understand it, ruled that these amendments uh, do not require um, the passing of a financial resolution uh, with regard to this bill. That's why the commission is relatively small, uh, capped at five members. That's why there is uh, no provision for the automatic remuneration of members of the commission. That would be for the cabinet secretary's um, discretion. I've tried to create a commission uh, in these amendments, which does absolutely nothing to get in the way of the cabinet secretary's uh, ambitions for a statutory uh, commission. We get not, absolutely nothing. It does absolutely nothing to get in the way for the secretary. Uh, for the, 
in the way of the Cabinet Secretary's ambitions for a poverty and inequality um, commission. Uh, so Amendment 15 creates the commission. Amendment 30 is a lengthy schedule that makes detailed provision for the commission in terms of size appointments, period of appointment, remuneration, and so on and so forth, designed specifically with the limits of the absence of a financial resolution in mind. And Amendment 20 um, provides for the commission to have a number of statutory functions, convener, all of which fall within the scope of this bill. Now, I fully understand um, uh, that the Cabinet Secretary's ambition is in the short term uh, for there to be a Poverty and Inequality Commission that doesn't look only at child poverty. Um, uh, but uh, uh, we cannot in this, well, I cannot in this um, bill uh, move uh, amendments that confer on this statutory commission um, functions that go out with the scope of the bill, and the bill is a child poverty bill. So the um, functions that the commission will start with are, are functions relating to child poverty, functions relating to the delivery plans, functions relating to the progress reports uh, provided for in this bill. But I would expect, and indeed, if I may say so, hope that in the future, um, the Cabinet Secretary and others will seek to amend and enlarge the scope of this commission so that it doesn't focus only on child poverty, but it focuses on uh, uh, poverty and inequality in the round. And there is nothing in my amendments that will, in the uh, uh, medium term, limit um, the functions of the commission uh, to child poverty. But we, of course, have to start there because we are dealing with a child poverty bill and it's important that the amendments, well, it's essential, that the amendments fall within the scope uh, of the bill, and um, that is why uh, the functions uh, conferred on this commission in Amendment 20 are functions that are relating to the delivery plans and the progress reports and the like uh, of this bill. I could also just say I think there are two amendments in this group convener that are not in my name that are in, I think, um, Pauline McNeill's name, Amendment 15A and Amendment 47, um, and we would support both of those amendments. Thank you, Mr. Tompkins. Paul McNeill to move and speak to Amendment 15A and other amendments in the group. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Convener. Um, well, these amendments were, were submitted um, following uh, the committee's uh, conclusion in relation to a Poverty and Inequality Commission, um, which I fully supported and uh, felt strongly that there should be an independent check. Um, by something like a commission on the government's uh, work. Um, so the, uh, I think there's a debate to be had about the, ne the, the size of the commission, and I wasn't, um, you know, I, I still to be convinced wholly about whether Adam Tonkin's amendments on the structure of the commission is, is the right one. Uh, I did feel it looped around the, the right size. Um, I think there were there were there was there was a lobby for a, a greater number of people, but I felt this was right. Um, I note the government have, um, since my submission of amendments, come forward with a, 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 a really comprehensive and a good proposal around the poverty and inequality commission that would go wider. Um, I think it does give the committee a bit of a, a bit of a dilemma because the committee, by a, a full consensus, thought that the proposals that they stood were weak without an independent, I mean, independent check in which Parliament would be um, paramount. So it certainly does give, I think, the committee a bit of a dilemma, and I'd like to hear what the cabinet secretary has has to say on this. I mean, I'm very conscious that this is stage two, and I never think at stage two everything has to be perfect. That's what the process is for. I would feel at this stage not to put something um, on the face of the bill in relation to some statutory body of some kind that had a check and balance over the child poverty targets would be a mistake. It's something that I... I would think about over the summer period towards stage three. I think the government also have to think about what might be missing from their own proposals um, as they stand, because, of course, the appointments would be made by ministers, not by the parliament. Um, and I, 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 please don't uh, misconstrue that I'm suggesting in any fashion that the appointments that you've made already are not good ones. I think that the appointment of Naomi Eisenstadt was a superb appointment and has been a massive contribution to the debate on poverty. And I, I've, I've cited her um, 
quotations on many occasions. But that's my concern, um, simply for the committee at this stage, simply to leave everything for the government when it's come quite late. So I don't want to um, not say I don't welcome what, what's happened, um, but, but I do think that element of it is missing. And, and just to conclude, Convener, um, at the end of the day, the committee are asked to come up with proposals to scrutinise child poverty in this in this bill, uh, you know that's that's our job, and I, I'd like to hear therefore on the government's proposals what of that could reassure the committee that there would be an independent appraisal of the child poverty targets. Okay. Oh, sorry, Pauline, could you move uh, Amendment 15A? And I'm moving in 15 years. <laughs> thank thank you very much. I have a couple of uh, members that wish to come in at the moment, uh, and then I can come back to CabSec if that's that's OK. Uh, ben McPherson, you wanted to come in? Yeah, thank, thank you, Convener. Um, I agree with the sentiment that we want to provide as much of a robust framework of scrutiny as we can, and I uh, appreciate that Adam Tonkins' proposal specifically is an ambition to try and uh, take forward that uh, criteria and that uh, set of uh, aspirations. However, uh, and it, it makes reference to 122 within the, the committee stage one report, that uh, recommendation within the report states that uh, there was an aspiration at the committee at that point for there to be some statutory oversight. However, Times have moved on since then. Specifically, we have been uh, informed more of what the Scottish Government's proposal for a Poverty and Inequality Commission would uh, encompass. And the, the difference uh, that's, been partic uh, that's taken place is that the, the recommendation within stage one was for a, a, a statutory body to potentially be created. Now we have a position where we can have a, a commission that is now more encompassing and more wide-ranging and also provide proper scrutiny at a parliamentary level. So the, 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 the proposals in front of us are, are quite different now that we have more, more knowledge of, of what the government is proposing. And I think what, what um, my view, in that, and, and I, I will speak on this more uh, fully in terms of my amendments, is that, that Parliament should be the main scrutinising place for this uh, act if it is passed by the will of Parliament. And um, I've tried to, sought to strengthen that through the amendments that I've brought forward. Unfortunately, Parliament can't be put on a statutory footing because it already uh, includes many... Uh, it can't put an obligation on a Cabinet Secretary appear for committee and, and other measures that I'll, I'll speak on later on, on my amendments. I think we should be mindful that uh, organisations like Oxfam that take a more holistic view to tackling poverty per se, rather than specifically child poverty, are in favour of keeping the Poverty and Inequality Commission broad, uh, wide-ranging, and uh, I think we have a, a a different proposition in front of us than we did at stage one now, which is that we can uh, thoroughly uh, analyse and thoroughly uh, <coughs> provide robust scrutiny over the process of this legislation and its implementation and everything that it encompasses going forward as a parliament, and that is our role and our job. And we can also, uh, as the government have put forward, have a wide-ranging commission that will tackle poverty in, in the main. Um, and I think that is a more appealing proposition and for that reason I am not uh, minded to support uh, Adam Tonks's Amendment 15 or uh, Pauline McNeill's Amendment 15A. Thank you very much. George Adams, you want to come in and, and Alison Johnson wants to come in also. George Adams. Thank you, Convener. I, I actually agree with much of what Ben has already said as well. I think part of the problem I have is the fact that, you know, I think it does get in the way the way we're doing it here. We also have a situation where we could actually limit it to the child and po uh, the child 
Poverty Bill, you know, um, not actually have that cross section. I know Adam said, uh, Mr. Tomkins said that we could possibly bring something back at a later date and do it then. I think we're overcomplicating a situation where we could actually get a, a poverty and inequality commission that can actually do something and make that difference cross portfolio and really kind of push something forward. Now, one of the other uh, issues that I have as well is, and I do believe that parliamentary scrutiny would be the way you've already got the reports that will be coming in year after. After year. But one of the th other issues that I have, and particularly with it, is the fact that the very idea of a poverty and inequality commission being designed by a member of the Conservative Party, you know, because uh, in my area, in very areas like it, it has been decades of uh, issues from the Conservative Party and Conservative rule that has actually caused some of the poverty and inequalities in our constituencies. And I really think that I find that quite difficult for myself, and I'd, I'd, I'd be difficult for me to be on that side as well, because we're talking about the architects of austerity, and even if you believe that uh, the Conservative parties are like some kind of washing powder, new, re-improved brand, you know, even if you believed that were true, and we didn't even think about the decades-long devastation that they've caused, even if you believed that was true, you would still have to look at the here and now and what their actions have been doing down in Westminster uh, with uh, their government, where they have literally been attacking on the disabled, attacking all the groups that we're talking about, and inequalities have become more... Uh, under the Tory. So that really, I have great difficulty with the idea of a Conservative trying to define a Poverty and Inequalities Commission. So in these two reasons alone, and on the fact that I think that we're actually just limiting the possibilities of this Poverty and Inequality Commission, I couldn't support any of this. Thank you very much, Ms Adams. Alison Johnson, and then Richard Leonard wants to come in as well. Um, thank you, Convener. I... I'm going to start by noting the fact that the Children's Commissioner, the Scottish Children's <coughs> Commissioner, in his um, response to our Stage 1 report said, and he was right, the Social Security Committee called for the establishment of an independent commission on a statutory footing. And that is indeed what the Stage 1 report says. And there was not a dissenting voice from this committee. Um, and I'm not convinced that a great deal has changed that yet. You know, nothing has happened to change that. I think we have a duty when looking at a child poverty bill to make sure that there is in place a statutory independent body to ensure that the changes we want to see with regards to child poverty do happen. Um, I, 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 you know, we're reinstating the targets that Westminster removed. I think that's the right thing to do, and I wholeheartedly support that. I do think it's an omission that we haven't taken steps to put in place a statutory commission um, and the committee has agreed that that should happen. I know the, the Scottish Government in their response to the Stage 1 report have said, well, you know, Westminster just got rid of the statutory commission. I think that's a mistake. But how much easier would it be to get rid of a non-statutory commission? I don't think that's helpful and I think it doesn't send a great message. I think children's organisations are supportive of statutory scrutiny. Um, and while we applaud the intentions of this government, and I have no doubt they're sincere, we may not always have this government. You know, we may have other governments with different views, and I think having a statutory commission is something that we have to consider very seriously. Um, you know, I, I, I understand, you know, George... Adam's concerns. I mean, the, the reason I don't support the, the idea of putting attainment into the bill, I think attainment suffers as a result of poverty, and I've no doubt that is, you know, tied in great measure to conservative welfare reform. But I'm not going to, you know, conflate the two issues here. I think we as a committee have a duty to ensure that this legislation is scrutinised independently by a statutory body. Thank you. Alison Johnson. Richard Leonard. Uh, yeah, just to um, add to Alison Johnson's remarks, um, uh, first of all, uh, anyone listening to uh, George Adams' contribution might be confused because there was unanimous uh, support by this committee for the establishment of a statutory body. Um, secondly, um, the alternative to um, amendments 15, 15A um, that have been suggested um, are on a non-statutory basis, the uh, Poverty and Inequality Commission uh, which has been floated as an idea, is a non-statutory body. Um, it will have, um, um, it's described as an independent chair, 
Um, but that independent chair will be appointed according to governmental patronage. Um, and that's whoever the government is. That's not a reflection of the present government. It's just the principle of uh, whether, whether that appointment is independent or an appointment of government or indeed an appointment of parliament. Um, the role, I think, is uh, largely a ministerial advisory role. Uh, it will have some uh, sc scrutinising uh, role as well. But on the whole, it sounds like quite a reactive rather than a proactive body, uh, which is uh, non-statutory. And for that reason, uh, I'm not persuaded that that represents uh, a step forward compared to the stage one recommendation which the uh, committee made. Thank you. Gordon Lintas, did you want to come in? Um, yes, I, I think I have to agree that I, I don't see what has changed since the committee unanimously formed the view that this was the way forward. And um, as far as the proposal set out, I uh, agree with what's just been said. Um, the, the issue is not about <clears throat> matters that have happened elsewhere in other fields, but it's specifically about this bill, ensuring that this bill is seen through to its proper conclusion, and uh, the form of statutory commission proposed will, in my view, do that. Cabinet Secretary, do you want to respond? Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Convener. I very much uh, do appreciate the, the comments and consideration uh, given by individual committee members as well as a uh, committee uh, collectively uh, as, as a whole. Um, I am glad that the, the five-page position paper that we published uh, at the beginning of the week, that, that members um, have found that um, helpful. If I could just say to uh, Pauline McNeil, I'm not going to read out the, all, all five pages, uh, but in terms of in page one, it does clearly say that the Commission will be independent. <coughs> it will have an independent chair who will determine the work programme of the Commission and it will be the independent chair who uh, appoints uh, the commissioners uh, and uh, the role of that uh, independent commission will be to provide free and frank advice to ministers uh, on how best to reduce uh, poverty and uh, in inequality. Uh, and as, as Richard Leonard um, highlights, I mean, it would be um, the government that would appoint uh, that chair, but then you know the committee uh, and others in Parliament, um, you know, would scrutinise that in, in their normal fashion. I don't know how we get out uh, the circle that you know somebody has to appoint uh, the first person. But I think it is important to recognise that the, the independent chair would then go on to make the, the, the other um, uh, appointments. If I could just make a, a very general remark, um, this legislation isn't just replacing uh, legislation or targets that were removed uh, by the UK government. We are actually instating uh, a more ambitious bill. Uh, the targets, as we've reflected upon at stage one, are more ambitious uh, in terms of uh, more stretching targets around persistent poverty and uh, are after uh, housing costs. And also in terms of a government, in, in general terms, we are, as a result of this bill, subject to far more scrutiny. Uh, under the previous UK legislation, we would um, you know, make a contribution uh, to a UK-wide report. Whereas in this bill, we are being uh, scrutinised, rightly, uh, and, and challenged uh, every step and turn uh, of the processes that we'll have to go through uh, with this bill. I do want to stress, Convener, that I do understand uh, why these amendments have been proposed, um, and I'll lay out the reasons why you know, I, I can't support them, uh, and I hope my, my reasoning will, will, be, will be clear. Um, I do think, however, given the tone and tenor of the debate, that we are um, probably reaching a bit more of a, sh a shared uh, understanding, and I think there is ground opening up that we... Um, you know, all seem to be collectively uh, occupying. Some of my reasons for, for not supporting the amendments uh, proposed uh, I already outlined in the Stage 1 report. Um, so members will know that we need to set up a commission quickly to provide advice for the first crucial uh, delivery plan. And as we've seen from previous experiences at a UK level, just because a commission um, is statutory doesn't uh, necessarily mean it has um, a secure future. But the key point for me is, is about remit. And I want to be clear about that point. I want the commission 
uh, to have a wide remit uh, on poverty and inequality. And I've listened very carefully to uh, the arguments in particular made by Labour members uh, in the Stage 1 debate. Uh, Labour members suggested, actually very passionately uh, in some cases, that a focus on all ages poverty is needed. Uh, and reflecting on those contributions, uh, I have some sympathy with the points uh, that Labour members and Pauline McNeill in particular uh, has made. I've also been listening very closely to Oxfam, who set out a compelling case for a body with a wide remit, focusing on income and wealth and equality. And Oxfam, as members will know, published a report in April, uh, and I've been very much persuaded by, by much of that Oxfam report. And that's why this uh, wider remit on all age poverty and economic uh, inequality is reflected in the proposals that are circulated to the committee uh, on, on Monday. Uh, and I am you know, delighted that Oxfam have offered uh, broad, broad support uh, for our commission model. And I suspect the members here, um, and I'm certainly, you know, certainly picking that up, are also supportive of the idea that a poverty and inequality commission should have that wider remit. Uh, but my real concern is that if the committee chooses to uh, go down the road of a statutory commission under Mr Tomkins' specific amendments, it would be a poverty and inequality commission in name only. And that's because, and I think, I think he you know, acknowledges in some regards uh, in his remarks, that the sole functions of a statutory commission could have, if delivered via this bill, are those conferred by statute. And it wouldn't be possible to amend the bill further to give the commission functions which don't relate to child poverty. And this means that the Commission will not be able to carry out functions relating to poverty or inequality matters uh, more uh, generally. Uh, new legislation would be needed to do this, and there is no bill at, at present suitable uh, for this purpose uh, or likely to be in the foreseeable future. If, on the other hand, um, the Commission is set up under um, my proposals, once it has done the work on the delivery plan, on the first delivery plan, it could be turning its attention to economic uh, inequality. Obviously, the Commission will set its own work plan. Um, or you know, it could be you know, looking at the automation of benefits, um, or it could be you know, looking at you know, extra costs faced by disabled people and lone parents, it could be looking at educational uh, inequalities. Uh, and I am, of course, very happy to discuss the future work programme with committee members. Um, and you know, I'm confident that the independent chair would be wanting to engage with committee on its uh, future uh, work programme. Um, but that will require on you know, committees decision about which, which model of commission to support. And I suppose, in short, the commission, as specified by Mr Tompkins, um, in my view, it would just be a missed opportunity to do work that actually, I'm sure, members would, would find extremely uh, valuable. Um, I do also want to mention uh, value for, for, for money, um, convener, um, and I know Mr Tompkins uh, verbalised his intentions, his, his very well intentions of, you know, not uh, racking up the, the costs in terms of a, a commission. Um, but his amendments set out that the Commission has, has a role in delivery plans, Amendment 20, uh, role in progress reports, Amendment 47, and also has an unlimited ability to draw on Scottish Government staff and resources, Amendment 30, and up to five permanent members stated in Amendment 30 also. And that the Commission can also set an unspecified number of committees as it sees fit, uh, with salary costs for unspecified numbers of committee members. And again, that's in uh, his, his Amendment 30. Um, and it struck me that Mr Tompkins' amendments are quite similar to the, the Scottish Fiscal Commission's legislative uh, structure, uh, which was set out in the Scottish Fiscal Commission Act 2016 um, with you know, the, the same membership rules. And the recurring costs of the Fiscal Commission uh, are estimated at around uh, £850,000 uh, per year from 2017 onwards. Uh, similarly, uh, the Scottish Land Commission, uh, established under the Land Reform Act 2016, has six members, rather than Mr Tompkins' proposed five. Uh, and the Act's financial memorandum uh, set out an annual cost for the Land Commission at £1.3 million. So my, my real concern is that we would end up with um, an expensive uh, commission, uh, despite people's you know, very best of intentions, but also with a commission uh, which its focus would 
then be strictly limited to, to this bill. So in the model that I'm proposing, um, the Scottish Government would be able to uh, cover a range of core costs and the remit would be much wider, uh, making this proposition, in my view, bet better value for money. Um, I am concerned that what's proposed is an expensive uh, statutory commission that would have actually also a lot of downtime. Uh, it would have uh, just two delivery plans to advise on over the period to 2030, uh, because, of course, the statutory commission it wouldn't be set up in time to advise on the first one. Uh, and this also makes me think that it wouldn't be, um, you know, potentially an attractive offer for high quality candidates who might you know, otherwise be commissioners. So while I absolutely appreciate why um, some people are arguing for a statutory body, I'm concerned that voting for Mr Tomkins' amendments would not deliver uh, that wider commission, the better value commission that Oxfam uh, and our partners, and I think that most of us here are, 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 are trying to want to see and are trying to get to that position. And I just want to finally say that um, I do strongly believe uh, in the model of commission that's reflected uh, in my proposals, and I appreciate the views and the position of, of committee. Um, but I do have to say that as a government, we, we have a manifesto commitment to set up a poverty and inequality commission, uh, and we will um, you know, do so to make sure that we get the very best of advice for the first delivery plan. Whether the Commission um, is able, uh, after that plan is published, to look at the wider issues that I've outlined, you know, economic inequality, automation of uh, benefits, disability costs, um, you know, will depend entirely you know, upon the decisions uh, that the Committee uh, now makes. So, convener, for the reasons I've set out, if I can say with respect that I cannot support amendments 15, 15A, 30, 20 and 47, and would ask members instead to um, engage with me uh, on the Commission proposal proposals uh, that I have uh, extended to see how we could take those proposals uh, forward. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Adam Tonkins to wind up. Thank you, Karina. I think it's been a very good um, and useful debate on the whole. Um, I'm afraid I haven't heard anything um, uh, from any member that um, affects or changes the core recommendation that this committee made only a few weeks ago and made unanimously um, uh, that uh, the committee believes that the establishment of a commission on a statutory footing is required. Um, I believed that a statutory commission was required when I agreed to that paragraph um, uh, of our report a few weeks ago, and I still I've listened very carefully to all of the um, remarks that have been made, uh, um, uh, and I, 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 nothing has been said um, to dilute or even um, uh, put any doubt on the validity uh, and importance um, of that uh, conclusion. It, it, whether the commission is statutory or not is not simply a question of form. It's a question of who gets to decide, um, you know, what the remit of the commission is, who, who might serve on the commission, and what the commission's functions are. And you know, should that question be a question? Should those questions be questions that the Parliament decides, um, or should those questions be matters that the government privately decides, perhaps in consultation with Parliament, perhaps not? Um, and you know, I, I, when uh, you know, my very strong view is that these are matters that should be for Parliament uh, and not uh, for government. Not Parliament working against government, Parliament working with government, but Parliament non 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 nonetheless. That's why it's important that the Commission is on a statutory footing uh, and and uh, not a uh, non-statutory uh, footing. This morning, um, this is the final thing uh, I'll say uh, on this convener. This morning, I received a completely unsolicited email from Bruce Adamson, the Children and Young per People's Commissioner for Scotland, the office that Alison Johnston referred to a few moments ago, in which he um, articulated his support uh, for um, these amendments. Um, I asked him whether this was a matter that I could share with the committee or whether this was a private communication, and he obviously told me that it was something that I could share with the committee, so I do so. Um, uh, the, the, these amendments do nothing more than give effect to this committee's unanimous <coughs> recommendation in paragraph 122 of its report, and they are amendments that are supported by, the, by Scotland's Children and Young People's Commissioner. Uh, thank you, Mr Tompkins. Paul McNeill, to wind up, um, press or withdraw your amendment. Yeah, the, the, I'm so concerned that, there's, that there isn't anything which the Cabinet Secretary has said that the wider Commission will do um, to, to reassure me on the independent scrutiny 
of the child poverty targets. Now, I, I totally support what Cabinet Secretary is saying about the wider work that's needed. But the difficulty I have is that my job here today, and as being a member of this committee, is to look at the bill that we are that is before us and to look at the report that we compiled. And if I'm going to depart from the position that I took to, towards the government position, um, I, I would need to be satisfied that, that what this committee agreed, that there should be independent statutory scrutiny. There would need to be something in what the Cabinet Secretary has given the committee, which is a government appointed, albeit that the commissioners will appoint other commissioners. I'm a member, they have the right to think about this over the summer. I'm not saying this is my final view on the matter. I, and I think the Cabinet Secretary will appreciate that it, we've only seen the vision in the last few days. Um, you know, we were working, as, I mean, I'm sure you've been in this position where, you know, you're trying to get your amendments in, discuss with colleagues, discuss with organisations that have an interest. And that work was done. And what, what came through, even from the organisations that lobbied us, <laughs> including Oxfam, eh, asked for a statutory independent commission. So I would, I would certainly like longer to think about this and on the basis of that for the purposes of stage two i'm going to press my amendment uh, thank you very much paul mcneil uh, the question is that amendment 15a be agreed to are we all agreed yes okay. there's going to be a vote uh, the question is that uh, amendment 15a be agreed to those in favor please <coughs> raise your hands Those against, please raise your hands. Thank you. And the total votes uh, five are uh, four. Four against, no abstentions, and Amendment 15A is agreed to. Thank you. Adam Tompkins to press or withdraw Amendment 15. Press. Thank you. Are we agreed that Amendment 15 be agreed to? Yes. yes. Uh, we'll go to a vote. Those in favour of Amendment 15, please raise your hand. <coughs> the clerks have a difficulty seeing round the corner, Alison, sorry. Yeah. You can get your hand up. Okay. Uh, those against, please raise your hand. Uh, total votes for five, total votes against four, no abstentions, and <coughs> 15 is uh, agreed to. Thank you. Uh, call amendment 30 in the name of Adam Tompkins, already debated with amendment 15. Adam Tompkins, move or not move? Move. Are we agreed? No, we don't put a question on that just now. It's just... I'm just here. The question is amendment 30 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Uh, we're not agreed. There's going to be a vote. Uh, those in favour of Amendment 30, please raise your hands. Those against Amendment 30, please raise your hands. Any abstentions to Amendment 30? No. Thank you. Total votes four are five, total votes against four, no abstentions. Amendment 30 is agreed to. Thank you very much. Uh, call Amendment 16, in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped in Amendment 17. Uh, Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 16. Sorry, it's 16. There's the light shining on it, looked like 15. Sorry about that, apologies. Call Amendment 16 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with Amendment 17. Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 16 and speak to both amendments in the group. 
Okay, thank you, Convener. These amendments are a, a direct response to the Committee's Stage 1 recommendations that delivery plans should coincide with the start of parliamentary terms. Amendments 16 and 17 will move the, the end date of the first delivery plan and the start date of the second delivery plan until after the day of the next Scottish elections, allowing a newly formed administration to uh, publish a delivery plan uh, which reflects their priorities for the parliamentary session and ensuring that they are not bound uh, by the plans of a previous government. The end uh, date of the second plan, 31st March 2026, already falls uh, after a Scottish election year. Uh, this approach will also allow time for reflection, to learn from the actions of the previous session and to allow the newly formed administration to draft a delivery plan in line with the manifesto uh, on which they are elected uh, and their priorities uh, for that parliamentary session. The changes outlined in these amendments will mean that the periods covered by delivery plans are spread more evenly, uh, two four-year plans followed by a five-year plan. Uh, as Bernardo's Scotland said in the response to our consultation on the bill, extending the period covered by the proposed delivery plans will also provide a more realistic time frame in which new policies can be developed, implemented and their impact assessed. Uh, convener, amending the periods covered by the delivery plans is a sensible and practical step which responds to the clear recommendations of stakeholders uh, and the committee. Uh, I move Amendment 16. Thank you. Any members wish to come in? Uh, Cabinet Secretary, do you wish to wind up or is that your statement? Um, uh, nothing further to add. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 16 be, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Call Amendment 17 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary already debated. Amendment 16, Cabinet Secretary, to move formally? It uh, move. Thank you. Questions at Amendment 17 to be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Okay. I now call Amendment 31 in the name of Pauline McNeill, grouped with other amendments in the groupings. Pauline McNeill to move Amendment 31 and speak to all amendments in the group. Okay. Um, so this group is about the delivery plans and I'm speaking to Amendment 31. Um, so it seems that the delivery plans are the very heart of the bill, obviously sets out how the government um, will go about reducing child poverty and telling what policy measures that they will take. And presumably in some, uh, before we get to that stage, ministers will take um, necessary advice, make their own judgment on that, and they'll present parliament with a plan as to how they intend to go about it. Um, uh, Amendment 31 is intended to consider whether or not uh, there should be some kind of assessment of um, ministerial proposers, proposals to, um, to reduce um, child poverty um, so that we can see how the government arrived at the um, particular proposals and decisions. I guess it's also um, to give a bit of transparency um, Perhaps the government think that's already provided for in all the dimensions of the bill, but I did want to debate uh, whether uh, or not there was something else in the bill. Um, I suppose I wanted to see whether it would be clear to the parliament uh, when we see the delivery plan, if, the, if they were to make some policy suggestions, how they arrived at that, and so that there's transparency in it. I mean, that's not to... Uh, negate the fact that the parties will put in the delivery plans, I guess, manifesto commitments if they believe in them in terms of reducing child poverty, which is perfectly fair. Um, but I think there should be some transparency around how government arrives at the decisions to put in the delivery plan, and the Amendment 31 um, tries to address that. Could you move the amendment, Pauline, please? And I move the amendment. Can thank you. Have? Thank you very much. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, to speak to Amendment 18 and other amendments in the group. Uh, thanks, Convener. My amendments in this group are aimed at setting out a list of touchstone issues that we will consider when developing our delivery plans. Uh, this is in response to evidence uh, from stakeholders during Stage 1 and in response to uh, the Committee's recommendation. The Bill, as introduced, uh, did not include a list of areas that delivery plans would be expected to cover. Uh, this was a, a departure from the approach taken in the Child Poverty 2010 Act. The rationale for this departure was that the Scottish Government has committed to taking advice from a wide range of partners in developing delivery plans which could inform uh, their content better than a list. Uh, in particular, we are keen that our Poverty and Inequality Commission will play uh, a key role in advising us uh, on the plans. However, 
um, as set out in a response to the committee's stage one report, uh, the Scottish Government recognises that the balance of opinion heard from key partners during stage one proceedings is in favour of more detail uh, being set out in the bill. Uh, in light of this, uh, I am bringing forward uh, Amendment 18, which sets out a number of key areas where ministers uh, must consider the scope to take action when preparing delivery plans, uh, including the provision of financial support to parents, uh, the provision of information, advice and assistance on social security matters and on income maximisation uh, and other key issues that we know are related to poverty, uh, such as education, housing, health, childcare and employment. Of course, I would not want to suggest that this is a, a, an exhaustive list, uh, but I believe that it sets out clearly the key issues that the committee uh, would expect me to consider as, as a minimum when preparing a delivery plan. Uh, my Amendment 22 provides that in the context of this section, uh, parent has an extended meaning to also refer to anyone who lives with and has care of a child. Um, I will now turn convener to the amendments lodged by committee members in this group, some of which are minded to support. Uh, Ruth McGuire looks to add in financial support uh, as an area that should be included when we are considering the availability of information, advice and guidance. I can see the merit in this. I'm also happy to include the words affordability in relation to housing and childcare. I appreciate that affordability uh, is key here. Uh, therefore, support amendments 18b, 18c and 18d in the name of Ruth McGuire. Uh, similarly, I'm supportive of Polly McNeill's Amendment 31, which seeks to strengthen the requirements on Scottish ministers in relation uh, to the delivery plan by requiring ministers to explain how the measures they propose in each plan are expected to contribute to the targets. As I made clear in our earlier discussion about interim targets, I am absolutely committed to ensuring that policies are grounded uh, in the evidence and I would be uh, content to make this more explicit in the bill as proposed in Amendment 31. I'll now return to the remaining amendments uh, in the group, which I'm afraid I cannot support, and I'll just outline briefly my, my reasoning. Amendment 5, in the name of Adam Tompkins, requires ministers to set out their plans to reduce uh, the poverty-related uh, attainment gap. Once again, um, I would remind Mr Tompkins of the existing legislative duties on Scottish ministers uh, in relation uh, to uh, attainment in terms of uh, the socio-economic duty in terms of reducing uh, the attainment gap, but also the requirement uh, that ministers have in and around the National Improvement Framework and the, their annual reporting requirements as well. I would also point out that my Amendment 18 includes education as a touchstone issue uh, for the delivery plans and, as Mr Tompkins is aware, our Child Poverty Measurement Framework, which I have already committed to including in the delivery plan, uh, contains measures uh, relating to uh, educational attainment. We have already discussed this morning Mr Tompkins' views on the need for a, a target related to what he calls workless households. As you know, I disagree uh, with that view and I do not think a focus on workless households is helpful or appropriate and that it completely ignores the fact uh, that in-work poverty is a, a growing issue. Uh, his Amendment uh, 6 requires delivery plans to set out measures related to worklessness. Uh, as I said in the earlier discussion on targets, I do not agree uh, with his workless household measure and I therefore do not support including it in, in the delivery plans. Polly McNeill has brought forward uh, an interesting proposal with amendments 8 and 18A uh, related to the automation payment of benefits. And I have spoken in detail with Ms McNeill about this. And my understanding is that her proposal is based on a pilot that is running in Glasgow where uh, school uniform grants can be set out automatically to families uh, without them having to apply for it on the basis of other data uh, held by the local authority uh, about their entitlement. And I am absolutely supportive of this idea. I'd be very happy to discuss with uh, Ms McNeill how we can take this forward to see whether uh, the good practice from Glasgow can be rolled out elsewhere. And I would also be willing to take this proposal uh, to our local reference group uh, and report back to committee on the outcome of that discussion. Um, however, I am unfortunately not able to support Ms McNeill's specific Amendment 8, as I do not believe that the wording here matches the intention. Uh, I would be willing to support in principle Amendment 18A on the basis that Ms McNeill and I can discuss further in advance of Stage 3 to ensure that it actually achieves what she intends. 
Amendment uh, 30, also in the name of Pauline McNeill, requires Scottish ministers to set out measures that they will take in relation to single parent households, and I am reluctant to accept an amendment of this type. Uh, the measures that I have uh, that I will set out in the delivery plans will be aimed at supporting all low-income families, and I do not think it is appropriate to single out particular groups in this way. Richard Leonard's Amendment 39 requires a plan to set out steps to be taken in relation to uh, setting the, the amount of revenue support grant that is paid to local authorities uh, for directing resources at targets. Uh, we have heard time and time again from stakeholders that this bill needs to remain focused uh, and that we must not over overcomplicate it. With that in mind, I'm sure Mr Leonard will agree uh, with me that a provision on local government funding arrangements is not an appropriate addition. Much of Alison Johnson's Amendment 37 uh, is similar to my Amendment 18. It includes uh, issues around income maximisation, uh, housing, childcare and employment. And I welcome these common areas of focus, along with Pauline McNeill's Amendment 32 and Ruth Maguire's Amendment 18e. It attempts to require the Scottish Government to set out in a delivery plan uh, how we plan to use uh, social security powers. Uh, in my view, the planning and reporting processes set out in the Bill it will be a tool to galvanise action across government and we will certainly be looking at how our social security plans can contribute uh, to meeting the targets. However, I do not think that it is appropriate to co require consideration of specific social security measures uh, as part of the delivery plans. Uh, the purpose of including a list of touchstone issues is to set out a broad framework uh, for the delivery plans. It is not to force Scottish ministers into taking particular uh, measures, <coughs> such as the topping up of child benefit, on which I have already expressed uh, my view that it is just not sufficiently targeted. However, uh, in the spirit of uh, <coughs> Co-cooperation. Um, I would be willing on this occasion to support Ruth Maguire's Amendment 18E, uh, subject to further refinement at stage three to ensure that it works as intended. Uh, I hope committee members will agree that, along with amendments 18A, B, C, and D, in the name of Ms. Maguire and Pauline McNeill, that these represent a reasonable uh, compromise that we can all agree on. Uh, convener, as uh, Cabinet Secretary for Equalities and a government absolutely committed uh, to equalities, uh, I strongly empathise with the intent behind Jackie Bailey's Equalities Amendment, uh, both 19 in this group and others in subsequent groups. However, as the committee will know, the Scottish Government and the wider public sector is already bound uh, by the public sector equality duty set out in the Equality Act 2010. Uh, that Act makes sure that consultation and consideration of different protected characteristics is built into public sector ways of working. And the public sector in Scotland is also uh, bound by the Scottish specific equality duties uh, introduced in May uh, 2012. Uh, every new policy or programme requires an equality impact assessment, or an EQIA, and there are strict rules about how these EQIAs must be drawn up and put into the public domain. What's more, ministers and the public sector can be held to account by the regulator of the Equality Act, uh, that's the Equality and Human Rights Commission. With all of this in mind, uh, I can reassure Jackie Bailey today that our delivery plans will be developed uh, alongside an EQIA, uh, which we will, of course, publish, and we would expect local plans to similarly be supported by EQIAs. Our progress reports uh, will have specific sections on each of the protected characteristics. Witnesses during stage one stress that this is a simple framework bill and should not be overcomplicated. It is hard not to see these amendments as um, an unnecessary complication when the public sector is already bound uh, by the framework of equality duties that I have described. Specifically, uh, convener, it is not clear what Jackie uh, Bailey's amendments re would require ministers and local organisations to do, as the reference to persons having protected characteristics lacks focus in the circumstances where actually every person has more than one protected characteristic, being age and gender at the least. 
I will, however, acknowledge that the, the landscape of duties is changing. Uh, we recently introduced child rights and wellbeing impact assessments to meet our duties under Children and Young People Scotland Act 2014. And we are shortly to consult on commencing the socio-economic duty, uh, which will have its uh, own impact assessment strand. Both these offer the, the opportunity to strengthen our equality practice still further, and I would be willing to meet Ms Bailey to discuss these developments, if that would help reassure her uh, on these points. I would also reiterate the points I made earlier about our measurement framework. We will be revising this in time for the delivery plan, and I repeat my offer to take suggestions from any member of the committee uh, about how this could be strengthened to best reflect uh, some of the important issues uh, raised in these uh, amendments. Uh, so finally, convener, I urge uh, members to support my amendments 18 and 22 and to support other amendments 31, 18A to E, and I urge members to resist amendments 5, 6, 8, 19, 32, 37, 38 and 39. Thank you very much for a very comprehensive uh, reply. Ruth uh, Maguire to uh, speak to Amendment 18B and other amendments in the group. Thank Thanks, you. Convener. I'm seeking to amend the Cabinet Secretary's amendments to strengthen what delivery plans should have whilst keeping a broad brush approach to what should be included in the plan. I am pleased that the Cabinet Secretary is looking at advice and assistance in social security and income maximisation, but I wanted this to go further and include financial support. Financial support is mentioned by her in ensuring its provision will be considered in the delivery plan, as it should, but I also want to know that people have the advice and assistance in how to get that financial support too, whether that be a social security benefit, a passported benefit such as a school uniform grant or free school meal, or any other support that's available to help low-income families, whether that's provided by the UK government, the Scottish government, the local authority, or uh, even a local charity. Like Alison Johnston, I think it's not just the availability of childcare and housing that's important, but affordability too. We can have a wide availability of childcare, but if it's unaffordable, it's effectively unaccessible and a barrier to those on low incomes. That's why I also welcome the increase in free childcare hours being made available by the Scottish Government. My arguments on including affordability in terms of housing are the same. We can consider the availability of housing and find that there's plenty of available mansions. This does little to help a low income family. It is affordability that matters. Again, like Alison Johnston, I want to know that the delivery plan has considered the use of new social security powers, both those that we know are coming to us and any new social security powers that may be devolved in the future, which could be considered as tools in tackling child poverty. But I don't think it's necessary to be so prescriptive as to what particular powers they should be, as Alison is seeking. I believe that my amendments are a good compromise between the amendments of the Cabinet Secretary and Alison Johnston, and I hope that the committee and indeed the Cabinet Secretary will support them. Thank you very much, Mr. McGuire. Uh, Adam Tom could speak to Amendment 5 and any other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, um, uh, I think that Section 7 um, of the Act, which is the provision in the Act that deals with delivery plans, is one of the most important sections uh, in the Act. Uh, I think that the committee very strongly took the view. Um, during the course of our stage one inquiry that the um, uh, Act was going to stand or fall really on the success of the, the delivery plans um, and the provision in section 7 on delivery plans was was, was weak and, 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 and rather skeletal uh, as the bill as the bill was introduced um, I very warmly welcome the cabinet secretary's amendment 18 uh, to specify a, a broad range of issues including education and employment um, that delivery plans must, uh, uh, take, a, take into account, and we will be supporting that amendment. Um, I, I won't press amendments five and six, um, given the inclusion of um, education and employment within the Cabinet Secretary's Amendment 18, but I will reserve the right to revisit the question uh, at stage three to see whether we think that there are any forms of words that could uh, strengthen um, uh, um, Section 17 if indeed it is amended uh, today uh, in accordance with um, the Cabinet Secretary's Amendment uh, 18. Thank you very much, Mr Tompkins. Can I welcome Jackie Bailey, MSP? Um, thank you very much 
for putting in an amendment and coming along today, obviously. Uh, Jackie Bayless to speak to Amendment 19 and other amendments in the group. And can I thank you, convener, for allowing me to attend the committee. Um, the purpose of Amendment 19 is to include measures in the delivery plan that take account of poverty in relation to other relevant protected characteristics. Um, and I think we all know that when equality is not embedded in policy from the very start, it becomes an add-on, it becomes an afterthought, so I think it's critically important that it's on the face of the bill. Um, it's important, I think, for us all to remember that poverty does affect um, different equality groups in slightly different ways. So if you actually want to achieve tackling child poverty, as I know you do, then we absolutely have to take this into account when developing policies and actions. And let, let me give you an example of this, because the government's own child poverty measurement framework tells us that um, employment rate for parents is something like 81%. But we know that this is significantly lower for parents from a BME background. So actions to improve the employment rate will need a targeted approach. And if our policies don't reflect the barriers faced by BME people, for example, um, or even families where there is a disabled person, then we won't succeed and inequality will continue. Um, so I suspect there's agreement on this point. The, the, the issue of difference is the mechanism by which we achieve it. Now, I understand the Cabinet Secretary's view that my amendment is flawed and not correctly worded. I am, of course, happy to adjust this, and we'll bring it back at stage three, very tightly focused, so there is no excuse for not supporting it. But let me take on the more serious argument. The notion that this amendment and others I propose later are not necessary because we have equality impact assessments um, does need to be challenged, and, and, and let me set out why. Equality impact assessments, there's no duty to involve or consult. If an equality impact assessment is poor, um, I find no evidence of any further action having been taken, either in the courts or by the Equality and Human Rights Commission. No public body has been taken to court. No equality impact assessment has been challenged. And indeed, some have not submitted them, and I don't think they've been pulled to task for that. And let me give you two examples from the government. There's an equality impact assessment on this child poverty bill. It's thin. There's very little specific detail about the protected characteristics. The equality impact assessment on the mental health strategy has no mention of race or ethnicity at all. And yet we know there's a differential impact on BME communities in relation to mental health. And that has a knock-on consequence for policy development. The Scottish Government's own Child Poverty in Scotland publication doesn't mention ethnicity alongside characteristics that may make child poverty more likely. And we all agree that ethnicity does have an impact on the level of child policy, um, poverty. Sorry. So race tends to get missed off the agenda. The First Minister's independent advisor in her report on shifting the curve said that BME groups are often the most disadvantaged and have additional barriers to face in escaping poverty. So I recognise the Cabinet Secretary's commitment. I welcome her empathy, but I really do feel she should take action. And this is not an unnecessary complication, because if you understand the interaction between race and disability and child poverty, then you absolutely need this on the face of the bill if you're going to achieve the ambitious targets you set out for yourself. Um, I'm always happy to meet the Cabinet Secretary, but let me say to her, I've not been persuaded by what she's told me, and I think this is sufficiently important for all of us that this should be on the face of the bill. Um, so on that basis, I move the amendment in my name. Thank you, Bailey. Um, Alison Johnson to speak to Amendment 37 and other amendments in the group. Um, thank you, convener. And with the withdrawal of Adam Tompkins' amendments 5 and 6, I am able to support all the amendments um, in this group. I think Jim McCormack and others emphasised the importance of content of the delivery plans in this bill. And at stage one, committee agreed unanimously that the plans should cover at least the five areas recommended by the End Child Poverty Coalition, and my amendment gives effect to this. The reason why the amendment spends more time laying out the social security recommendations is that this bill is about defining poverty in terms of income and we know that Social Security can do so much to help boost the incomes of the poorest families. The dramatic falls in child poverty that we saw in the 2000s owed more to the way the benefits system was improved 
such as through child tax credits, than to any other factors. And of course, setting targets in legislation is welcome and important, but urgent action to back up these targets is essential. There is good evidence to suggest, for example, that a £5 top-up to child benefit would make immediate inroads into child poverty. Research by the University of York, as we've heard, suggests that it could help 30,000 children escape relative child poverty. And all members of this committee will have received a briefing yesterday from a group of organisations including Child Poverty Action Group Scotland, the Poverty Alliance, Children in Scotland, Children First, the Scottish Women's Convention, the Conforti Institute and Justice and Peace Scotland, all calling for this amendment and Pauline McNeill's Amendment 32 to be passed, all citing the huge inroads the £5 top-up and uses of social security could make. That is not to say that some of the other areas that delivery plans might cover couldn't also help to reduce child poverty. My point is simply that we know that the use of some of these social security powers would have large and relatively speedy impacts on child poverty. And that justifies including how the delivery plans should address social security in more detail than some of the other areas recommended by the End Child Poverty Coalition and in more detail than the Cabinet Secretary's amendment does. I accept that the Cabinet Secretary has lodged a similar amendment and I support it, in particular the extra provisions for the delivery plans to include measures relating to the improvement of physical and mental health. But I do think it needs to go further uh, than what measures ministers are taking to provide financial support, which is quite broad. It should address the social security powers devolved by the 2016 Scotland Act specifically. As we can see from the social security bill lodged yesterday, the current Scottish Government is trying, is starting to set up what looks like might be quite a radical new system. And I don't see why the Cabinet Secretary wouldn't want to shout loudly and proudly about that in the delivery plans. And before I finish, Convener, I'd like to make clear, I think this is very important, that in no way does this amendment require, Miss Constance used the word force, in no way does this amendment require the Scottish Government to exercise child benefit top-up powers or any other social security powers. All it does is to require the Scottish Government to indicate in each delivery plan whether it intends to use these powers. And if it decided not to, then it would be free not to do so. Um, this is not at all prescriptive. And uh, you know, I wholeheartedly support Ruth Maguire's amendments because, of course, if childcare, for example, isn't affordable, it's simply not available to those who need it. But uh, just briefly, I'd also like to highlight that the amendment specifically addresses the issue of helping parents and carers access work that pays the Scottish living wage. And I hope that is something that the Scottish Government, with its fair work agenda, could support. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Ms Johnson. Uh, Richard Leonard to speak to Amendment 39 and other amendments in the group. Uh, thanks, Convener. Uh, can I move uh, Amendment 39, uh, which is in my name? Uh, it's designed to try to make sure that the greater level of resources go to the areas of uh, greatest need. And it's clear from the bill that local authorities in particular will have a critical role to play in delivering the achievement uh, of the targets which are set uh, in the bill. Uh, and uh, it's my firm view that more account needs to be given of deprivation of child poverty in the revenue support grant uh, process. So this um, very modest amendment is a gentle uh, ask of ministers to consider supporting those areas which have higher levels of child poverty through the local government uh, settlement. Uh, it's designed to help us meet the targets which are being set uh, by modifying the funding arrangement. Uh, it's clear people in poverty uh, are more reliant on local authority services, whether it's social work, education, for example, free school meals, uh, the, school <coughs> the school clothing grants, for example. Uh, and I'm, um, uh, I'm bound to say that uh, I don't wish to prejudice uh, the, um, the agreement earlier on between the Cabinet Secretary and Pauline McNeill to take forward uh, her uh, Amendment 18A on uh, the automaticity of benefits. But if that is to be taken forward, there will be greater pressure again on those local authority areas uh, which have got the highest rates of uh, child poverty. Uh, it's clear that some local authorities, if I can take North Lanarkshire for example, have a considerable way to go to achieve the target whereas uh, neighbouring Eastern Bartonshire, for example, has less far to travel uh, to meet the targets. 
Uh, finally, uh, the Scottish Government already takes some account of deprivation in the, in the allocation of some funding, and I'm thinking here of the uh, Attainment Challenge funding. But if we are to have a much wider ranging approach to tackling poverty, we need more funding uh, targeted to deprived areas and communities. I move uh, Amendment 39. <coughs> Thank you, Mr Leonard. George Asham, once again. Thank you, Convener. Uh, I would just like to say a lot of some of the issues that came up, uh, delivery plans, first and foremost, I agree with everyone else, they're the heart and soul of this bill. You know, they're, the, they're what's going to make it actually uh, work. Uh, it's in the title, <laughs> you know, delivery plan. But the, the whole idea is, I think the Cab Sex uh, Amendment 18 actually covers many of the issues that came up during... Uh, stage, uh, during the actual stage one and all the evidence that we took as well and I think that brings us on quite a bit uh, I personally uh, support Pauline McNeil's 31 and 18A because I think that brings a wee bit more detail to everything as well and I know that's been backed by others as well and all, my, all the, the amendments by my colleague uh, uh, Ruth Maguire as well so uh, as I said I, I really believe we need to get this part correct, we need to get it right. The other ones I don't feel at this stage I can actually support, uh, but uh, on the whole, I, I think it's still something we can discuss in stage three. We can look at where we go from there, but as I say, I can't emphasise enough how I believe that getting the delivery plans right is going to make all the difference in this actual bill. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Adam. Uh, Paul McNeil to wind up and press a withdrawal. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, uh, firstly, um, can, can I welcome what the Cabinet Secretary said about accepting Amendment 31, which simply is to, for the Government to explain why they're taking particular measures in the delivery plan, so I think that's really helpful. Um, on 18A, um, I, I'm particularly pleased that I think the, the Government is behind the idea that the, the, sh the automation of benefits should certainly be encouraged, and I know a lot more work needs to be done on this, and I know uh, yourself and also Jean Freeman are very, very keen on the whole idea of it. So I'm, I'm delighted um, to uh, be pressing on 18A and not to move Amendment 8, which doesn't really do what I wanted it to do in the first place. So, um, in relation to Amendment um, 32, um, for me, I, I will be supporting 37, which is Alison Johnson's amendment, because um, Labour does support, we do believe that there is evidence to suggest that top-up of uh, child benefit um, can make a dramatic difference to taking children out of poverty. But I wanted to make sure that, um, and of course, as Alison Johnson rightly points out, it's not to force the government's hand in any sense, but <coughs> they can say out the reasons why they support it or, or why they're not going to do it. But I also wanted to make sure that that was wide enough, um, given the powers on top-up benefits that are coming to the Scottish Government, that they could widen the scope of that to all benefits that they might consider. Um, as you know, um, the last Labour government, um, through the child tax benefits and working tax benefits, made a considerable difference to child poverty. So I thought at least that would be a consideration for future governments. So we think that 32 um, it widens um, that further. Um, and in relation to um, Amendment 38, um, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm being honest, um, I take on board the Cabinet Secretary's points about not setting out specific categories of groups, and I've listened very carefully to that. I, I do, however, ha have a, I still have a strong view that in relation, this amendment is really, um, although it's worded a person who is not a member of a couple and one or more children for whom that person is responsible, it is, is tackling the issue of single parents, which is a gender issue, we also know, because the vast majority of... The reason that I think I will press at this stage on Amendment 30 is that we think 2030 is a long way off. It is a long way off, but, it, but in kind of policy terms, it's really short. And I'm really keen that um, the delivery, d delivery plan, it does set out, I'm sure it will, set out measures of what the government will do in all sorts of areas that we've just, the committee have discussed. But I do think it's an area of policy that should be addressed in the delivery plan. And I think at this stage, I'd like to press um, for, for that reason. And I think that covers all the amendments. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, the question is that Amendment 31 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. 
<coughs> um, call Amendment 18, the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 31. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. It moved. Call Amendment 18A, in the name of Paula McNeill, already debated with Amendment 31. Paula McNeill, move. Move. Yep. Question is that Amendment 18A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment 18B, in the name of Ruth Maguire, already debated with Amendment 31. Ruth Maguire, move or not move? Thank you. Questions at Amendment 18B be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Call Amendment 18C in the name of Ruth Maguire, already debated with Amendment 31. Ruth Maguire to move or not move? Move. Questions at Amendment 18C be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment 18D in the name of Ruth Maguire, already debated with Amendment 31. Ruth Maguire to move or not move? Move. Question is at Amendment 18D be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Okay. Call Amendment 18E in the name of Ruth Maguire, already debated with Amendment 31. Ruth Maguire to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 18E be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, Cabinet Secretary to press or withdraw uh, 18 as amended. We press Amendment 18 as amended. Press. Thank you so much. The question is that Amendment 18 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Call Amendment 5 in the name of Adam Tompkins, already debated. Adam Tompkins, move or not move? Not move. Thank you so much. Uh, question is Amendment... No. Call Amendment 6 in the name of Adam Tompkins, already debated with Amendment 31. Adam Tompkins, move or not move? Not move. Not move. Thank you very much. Call Amendment 8 in the name of Paula McNeill, already debated. Amendment 31. Paula McNeill. Not move. Not move. Thank you. Call Amendment 19 in the name of Jackie Bailey, uh, already debated. Jackie Bailey, move or not move? Not move, but I signal my intention to bring it back at Stage 3 convener. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, call Amendment 32 in the name of Paula McNeill, already debated with Amendment 31. Paula McNeill, to move or not move? Move. The question is Amendment 30... Sorry. The question is Amendment 32 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are not all agreed, so there will be a vote. The question is Amendment 32 be agreed to. Those in favour, please raise your hands. Those against, please raise your hands. Just check that. <coughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Total votes four or five. Total votes against four. No abstentions. Uh, the amendment is agreed to. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just checking myself. I've got it all here. <laughs> Call amendment 37 in the name of Alison Johnson. Already debated. Alison Johnson to move or not move? Move. <coughs> Question that amendment 37 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, we're not all agreed. There will be a vote. Those in favour, please raise your hand. Uh, those against, please raise your hands. Thank you. Thank you. Um, those four, five, those against, four, no abstentions, and the amendment is agreed. Thank you. Call amendment 38, then Polly McNeil, already debated. Polly McNeil, to move or not move? Move. Question is that amendment 38 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We're not all agreed. There will be a vote. Those in favour of the amendment, please raise your hands. Those against, please raise your hands. We're going faster than the clerks. <laughs> Thank you. The votes are total votes four or five, votes against four, no abstentions. The amendment is agreed to. Thank you. Call Amendment 39, in the name of Richard Leonard, already debated. Richard Leonard to move or not move? Move. Thank you. The question is Amendment 39 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. No. No. We're not agreed. There will be a vote. Uh, those in favour, please raise your hand. Those against, please raise your hand. Thank you. Uh, total 
Votes four or five, total against four, no abstentions. The amendment is agreed to. Call amendment 20 in the name of Adam Tompkins, already debated. Adam Tompkins to move or not move? move. Amendment 20, the question is, is it agreed to? Are we all agreed? No, the, we're not all agreed. There will be a vote. Those in favour of Amendment 20, please raise your hands. Those against, please raise your hands. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, votes for five, votes against four, no abstentions. The amendment is agreed to. Thank you. Call Amendment 40 in the name of Ben McPherson. Groups of Amendments 41, 40, 21, 33 and 42. Ben McPherson to move Amendment 40 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. As uh, stated earlier when we uh, debated uh, about the proposed uh, Commission, my uh, hopes going through the amendment process here were to uh, establish as much parliamentary scrutiny on uh, the, the bill, if the will of Parliament, as possible. And that is uh, what these amendments are intended to do. As a member of Parliament, I believe it is uh, MSPs who should be scrutinising and holding the government to the account principally. Um, more so than, than a st statutory commission, um, and uh, obviously we've already had the debate on the amendments ar around the statutory commission in principle. However, I would still like to press these amendments in order to give Parliament an, an, an even greater say than is currently drafted in the uh, scrutinising the, the bill, if the will of Parliament. The, I look to, as stated earlier, to try and create an uh, obligation for the Cabinet Secretary to appear before this committee. However, uh, that was um, not uh, doable because of the fact that the uh, statute cannot dictate the work programme of a committee. Uh, however, the inclusion of 40, which uh, is an oblig if, if agreed, would be an obligation for the uh, cabinet secretary to make a, uh, the relevant uh, Scottish minister rather to make a statement. Um, 4A already uh, creates an obligation for the Scottish minister to lay the plan before the Scottish Parliament. Uh, however, uh, the inclusion of, of making a statement would also create an extra opportunity uh, and uh, making a statement, uh, as far as I am aware, from the, the drafting team at the Parliament here could include uh, either a statement in the chamber or a statement at committee. So that would, again, just en enhance the, the scrutinising element of the, the committee. And uh, also um, in pressing uh, section 41, uh, that would include the... Uh, the, uh, create an obligation for, uh, and during the preparation of the, the delivery plan, that Scottish ministers would have to consult the Scottish Parliament. And of course, uh, under uh, law and statute, the, the Scottish Parliament is encompassing of the chamber and committees. So the intention behind 40 and 41 is to create greater scrutiny. And I hope the committee and the cabinet secretary will support those amendments. Could you move amendments? And 40, I, I, please? I move 40 and 41 in my name. Thank you very much, Ms McPherson. Jackie Bailey to speak to Amendment 21 and other members. Thank you very much, Convener. Amendment 21 would require Scottish ministers to consult with groups with relevant protected characteristics. And, you know, very similar to the arguments I made before, um, we know that BME people, disabled people, are more likely to experience poverty. And I believe any consultation on delivery plans would be inadequate without their full inclusion. Um, it, basic principle, if you want to get it right, then include them in the process. And the bill requires Scottish ministers to consult with local authorities and persons organisations representing of working with children and parents. There's not a requirement to engage with equality groups who are more likely to be facing poverty, including BME families. And of course, the, the Cabinet Secretary will be very familiar with the race equality framework for Scotland because it commits the Scottish Government to increasing participation of representation of minority ethnic individuals in governance and influence in decision making at local and national level. So you believe in it, let's just put this in the bill. <clears throat> Thank you. Alison Johnson speaks to Amendment 33 and any other members? Um, 
Thank you, Convener. Amendment 33 requires the Scottish Government to consult people with direct experience of poverty. And while the bill requires consultation of groups representing poor families who clearly have very considerable experience, experience in the challenges we face and how we can make inroads into poverty, there are insights that only people with direct experience of poverty themselves can give. And I think this is entirely consistent with the Scottish Government's approach in establishing the new social security system, for example, uh, with 2,000 people with direct experience of the current benefits system currently being consulted. I think this is the right thing to do, and this bill would benefit from a similar approach. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms Johnson. Pauline McNeill, to speak to Amendment 42. Any other members in the group? Um, thank you very much. Um, <coughs> um, amendment 42 um, is designed for the ministers to leave before the parliament a draft of the delivery plan that they propose to prepare. Um, Scottish ministers must, in the plan, prepare and leave before the Scottish Parliament in accordance with subsection 40. Any kind of any comments on the proposed plan expressed by the Parliament within that period, and in calculating any period of 40 days for the purposes of this section. Um, it's really just to prove whether there should be a process for there to be commentary by the Parliament within a certain period of time um, on what the government proposed to do in the plan. Um, it's not designed for the Parliament to um, for approval or disapproval. It's it's um, it's designed to allow the Parliament to be able to comment on the government's plan so they can take account of it in their final deliberations. Thank you. And Mr. Cotton, do you want to take a minute? Uh, quick question. I just wonder if Ben McPherson would be able to address in his winding up um, on the debate in this group whether there are any precedents in the Scottish statute book for um, statutory requirements on ministers to make statements to Parliament um, or indeed to consult the Scottish Parliament in the, in the, in the, drafting, in the drafting of a report. I'm, I'm all in favour of effective and robust parliamentary uh, scrutiny of this and other issues, but I just wonder whether this is a, a novelty or uh, whether it's something which is uh, already there in other, in other domains um, in, the, in the statute book. Uh, Cabinet Secretary. Thank, thanks very much, Convener. Um, let me begin by responding to Alison Johnson's Amendment 33, which adds people with lived experience to poverty to the list of those that we will be required to consult on delivery plans. And I wholeheartedly accept and support this amendment. Uh, and I echo very much the views of the Poverty Alliance uh, that those with lived experience of poverty uh, are experts and they should be treated uh, as such. Uh, as a government, we have a strong record in meaningfully engaging with those uh, with lived experience of poverty. Uh, members uh, may recall the Fairer Scotland conversations and how that's seen 7,000 people uh, take part in over 200 public events and local discussions uh, across the country with individuals uh, passionately talking about what mattered to them most. Uh, and these conversations were extremely valuable and directly informed uh, our Fairer Scotland Action Plan, which was published uh, last October. And in that action plan, uh, we committed to establishing uh, three further organisations based on the exemplary work uh, of the Poverty Truth Commission. Uh, this uh, commitment will ensure that people with experience of living in poverty uh, can speak out, tackle stigma uh, and push for change uh, to public services. And we have already made uh, progress with this and will shortly be making an announcement uh, on the first of these new uh, organisations. I've already uh, set out my concerns in relation to Jackie Bailey's amendments uh, relating to equality considerations in previous groups, so I won't repeat them in full here, uh, other than to say that I, I note that she notes my concerns uh, about um, her drafting, and perhaps if I could be a little bit more specific uh, with phrases such as one or more protected characteristic, uh, that won't have the effect uh, to pay special attention or to target uh, specific groups. Uh, it will, in effect, apply to everyone, as we all have a gender and we all uh, have uh, age. Uh, so my, my concern is about uh, that her uh, amendments won't have the impact that she so uh, desires. Let me uh, turn now to amendments 40, 41 and 42 in the name of Ben McPherson and uh, Pauline McNeill, which seeks to strengthen parliamentary scrutiny of the, the delivery plans. I mean, let me begin by saying I'm absolutely committed to being uh, open and transparent, uh, and I fully expect that when I lay delivery plans and annual progress reports before Parliament, uh, 
you know, that Parliament, led by this committee, uh, will perform its usual robust and detailed uh, scrutiny. However, the very nature of delivery plans means that we will require a number of difficult and sensitive decisions to be made uh, about government priorities and spending. And I am more than happy, once those decisions have been made, to debate them fully with Parliament. And indeed, I fully expect Parliament to challenge and scrutinise the proposals. But I do not think that a full parliamentary consultation, as suggested by Ms McNeill's Amendment 42, is appropriate. Uh, and I am also concerned about timing, in particular the fact that this proposal would require a full 40-day period, excluding any recess dates, to be set aside for consultation. Uh, and I have set the Scottish Government an extremely tight deadline uh, for the first uh, delivery plan, and I have done so, and I have done that on, on purpose. Uh, so I think and I hope that we can all agree that it is uh, important to move as quickly as possible uh, on this crucial issue in terms of making progress with our first delivery plan. However, convener, I do very much appreciate that members uh, want to see um, some further detail in the bill around parliamentary involvement. Uh, I'm therefore willing to support Ben McPherson's amendments 40 and 41. Uh, these require ministers to consult with parliament uh, in developing the plan and to make a statement upon publishing the plan. Uh, and I would like to uh, reserve the right to consider whether there is a need to uh, refine drafting further at stage three to ensure that the intention behind the amendment are clear, but in principle uh, I would be very happy to be invited to a future committee session uh, to discuss the delivery plan and I would be pleased to reflect on any written report that comes uh, out of committee's considerations. Uh, it is a shame that Ben McPherson cannot confer a duty on the committee itself through his amendments, but um, I do want you as committee to be involved in the development uh, of the delivery plan. So, convener, for the reasons set out above, I support the amendment 33 in the name of Alison Johnston. 40 and 41 in the name of Ben McPherson, uh, but I oppose amendments 21 and 42. Thank you. Ben McPherson, to wind up, if you wish to wind up, press withdraw. Uh, th thank you, convener, and I'll just be as succinct as possible. Just uh, to, to reiterate my uh, overriding intention behind the, the two proposals, uh, amendments that I put forward was to enhance and um, promote as much uh, consultation and, and, and as much opportunity to scrutinise as possible. Therefore, uh, the proposed amendment at uh, 41 uh, to create uh, uh, an obligation when preparing the delivery plan to, for uh, the consultation with the, the Scottish Parliament, uh, that was an intention that um, is uh, in terms of drafting purposes, it reflects also 7.4, which requires the plan to be laid before the Parliament. So to, to answer Adam Tonkins there, there's a, there's a consistency on that measure. Um, and in terms of uh, making a statement, as specified earlier, my um, ambition was that there would be an obligation for uh, the, the minister to appear before committee. Um, that that uh, wasn't possible, as advised by um, the, the bill's team. However, uh, I am aware that uh, the Climate Change uh, Scotland Act 2009 includes duties on ministers to make a statement to Parliament after lodging reports, etc. So there is some precedent there, and um, that is why I, I would like to uh, press both of amendments in my name. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 4 to be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Um, Call Amendment 41 in the name of Ben McPherson. Already debated. Move or not move? Move. Question Amendment 41 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Call Amendment 21 in the name of Jackie Bailey. Already debated. Uh, Jackie Bailey, move or not move? Um, not moved, and I'll bring it back at stage three. Thank you very much. Call Amendment 33 in the name of Alison Johnson. Already uh, debated. Alison Johnson, move or not move? Move. Thank you. Question is that Amendment 31 be agreed to? Sorry, 33. Yes. Be agreed to. I'm jumping it over there. <laughs> Call Amendment 22 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated. Cabinet Secretary moved formally. It moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 22 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Call Amendment 42 in the name of Paula McNeill. Already debated. Paula McNeill, move or not move? Not moved. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, the question is Amendment 42. Oh, not moved. The question is that Section 7 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. <coughs> Call Amendment 43 in the name of Paula McNeill. Group of Amendment 48. Paula McNeill to move Amendment 43 and speak to both amendments in the group. 
Uh, thank you very much. Um, so this group deals with the reporting year um, on the delivery plan. Um, so 43 is designed to ensure that instead of uh, the current wording, which is that we're in reasonably practical, to ensure that there is a deadline on the government presenting that report of no later than the end of three months. Um, I'd be interested to, to hear what the Cabinet Secretary would have to say about that. I'm just trying to make sure that the government, government, if there's can't repeatedly put it off, and I'm not really sure what the term reasonably practical it means. Um, on uh, Amendment 34, it was just for completion on Jackie Bailey's amendment to ensure that if they were... Um, the, but, right, OK. Um, amendment 44... Right. Sorry. Was it only 43 and it's only 43 yeah, I'm speaking to? Yeah. Sorry. End of. Sorry. <laughs> you move amendment 43, Paul. I move. Thank you. Uh, time, unfortunately, has run away with us. Uh, we won't get finished the group two today, unfortunately. So we will have to come back. Uh, so this grouping will be the last one that we'll be able to do today, just to let, just to let you know, and maybe some succinct answers, whatever it may be. So Ben McPherson to speak to Amendment 48 and other amendments in the group. Very succinctly, Convener, um, as previously uh, with, with Section 7, the um, proposed amendment of, uh, 48 uh, seeks to uh, create an obligation uh, for the, the relevant minister to... Uh, make a statement um, in a similar manner uh, as articulated before. This statement could be to full parliament or to uh, committee, and it's around uh, trying to increase scrutiny and um, give this committee as much of a, a, a role as possible in the scrutinising of the progress reports. And I, I, I move the amendment to mind. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. Beener, I very much appreciate the rationale behind uh, both these amendments. Pauline McNeill's Amendment 43 clarifies that annual progress reports must be published within three months of the end of the reporting year. It would, of course, be my intention to publish them as soon as possible, and I am therefore content to have this additional detail set out in the bill. However, the final progress report, the report for the year 2030-31, setting out whether the targets for that year have been met, will not be able to be published until the statistics relevant to that year are available. I will therefore support the amendment today with a view to refining the draft and in time for stage three to make clear that the final report will be prepared as soon as reasonably practical eh, after the end of the reporting year. Eh, ben McPherson's suggestion that we make a statement upon laying the annual progress report is also welcome. As I set out in our discussions of the amendments relating to delivery plans, eh, I fully expect Parliament to carry out robust and detailed scrutiny of all all of our work under this legislation, and I can see no difficulty uh, in therefore giving a statement to Parliament if such a requirement is considered by committee today to be appropriate. And while I agree with the policy behind uh, the amendment, uh, if the amendment is agreed today, I would propose to adjust the drafting of the amendment at stage three to make it clear that the statement is to be made to the Parliament and it is to relate to the progress report. So I therefore support amendments 43 and 48. Thank, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Paul you to wind up and press her withdrawal. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm happy at that, and I'm, I went to press. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 43 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. OK. Um, if you want to do another group, we can. <laughs> I, I'm a, we're not going to finish today. No, we're not going to finish today, and I wouldn't like to start another group, unfortunately, mm -hmm. because we may be halfway through it. So I feel that I'm, Ben McPherson's amendments within the other group, so therefore we won't come to uh, a vote on that. Sorry, Jacqueline. Sorry, convener. Um, I entirely accept what, what you're saying about moving business. Um, unfortunately, I have an amendment in the very last group. I understand you're meeting Monday. Um, I am on other committee business at that time. So I wonder whether I could formally, or even next Thursday, because I chair another committee, um, if I could formally withdraw 27, because the minister objects to it on the same basis that it's too widely drafted, um, and I will bring it back at stage three. 
Th thank you very much, um, Jackie. Uh, basically, we're, we're not going to be through this on the Monday, but we'll be through it on the Thursday. But you have already said that you can't do that. I can check with the clerks if that's, you know, we can do that ab about for withdrawing it or someone else from the committee at the, the day. A member of the committee can withdraw it on your behalf. So if that's, that's all right. Thank you very much for, for being so understanding. Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. No, no it's, it's, in another, it's another group. We need to do it in martial order. Yes, unfortunately, it's in martial order. If we start the other group, we may not finish till about 25 to 2. Uh, but thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. And I formally close the meeting. Thank you.